everybody. This is the Good Anime Palette Podcast. This is episode number 29. I was thinking of a good intro, couldn't think of one, so I decided, well, you know what? You're not going to get it. But you are going to get Jason as your co-host, and you're going to get Will as your other co-host, joined as always, as usual. Way to fucking blue ball the audience, Jesus. I'm like, sorry. I'm so ready to give you a good intro, but I'm not giving it to you today. You're going to have to check in next week or the week after. You know what? I'm so excited to be on the podcast again because I was literally, literally in my room at home for two weeks, did not go outside, didn't even like like really associate with anyone in person other than my family and i was itching to record really it's it's been it's been a rough uh past couple of weeks um particularly here in hong kong i mean socially and mentally it's like we're, we're all just trying to manage um especially with the outbreak of omicron here but so far so good we're all safe we're all healthy and we're able to continue producing more material for everybody so um yeah welcome back to the MA Pilot podcast and let's get started with today's uh discussion or well, the discussion today's episode but, but actually before that uh in 24 hours of recording oh, God, yeah. will william edgelord wong is full name purposes now well okay, yeah, right? yeah well technically when it's we, on our website too, yeah it's right? on our website so you can't hide that and it's copyrighted under both our full names it's your birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday to me in 24 hours. Happy day of your birth. That comes around every cycle of the 365 days. Yeah. it's um, it's um, It's been a very anticlimactic like, reach towards my birthday. Usually there'd be like some excitement, but because of the fact that I've been indoors like for the last two weeks and haven't really been outside or talked to many people, it's it just doesn't make any sense for me to actually like arrange something like to get friends over because that's illegal under the Hong Kong like quarantine and like social distancing measures. And also it's like, I don't want to invite people out in public because I don't want to risk people getting COVID. So why not just lay low and just, you know, just keep to myself and enjoy my birthday. I mean, I did that for my birthday in November. After, so. after, after a while, it's, it doesn't seem like birthday parties or like birthday gatherings are all that exciting. It's just it's just time and money and energy. And I'd rather just, you know, just maybe make, make a nice steak and just watch like a good amount of anime, which which we both have done. In fact, I've done a fuck ton of it the last two weeks and it's been glorious. So now for Will's birthday, I have prepared Oh, a set of gifts, a pair of gifts. These were all in the making for like three months. Yes. Uh, I had to find this thing and then find the other thing. And one of these things were, I forgot the date. What was it? 1990 something. So I had to literally talk to someone in Japan to find this thing, have them ship it to me. And uh, the other thing actually was like relatively easy. So... Will doesn't know about. Will knows I don't, about. I don't know shit. No, no, you know that there is gifts for I your know birthday. gifts, but it's also like when you're saying you got some crazy ass 1990s like anime artifact like shipped straight from Nippon, and then the other thing is just like something you bought off Amazon or whatever. It's like I I don't fucking know what you got ho- ho- me. Hold on, it is from Nayagawa, Japan. Where I have the address right the here. The fuck is that? Okay, so while you check on that, um, oops, sorry. Uh, Will, I accidentally yanked something. Yeah, you're fine. No, no, I can't hear anything. My bad, guys. A little bit of technical difficulty. There's a lot of wires all over the damn place. Overexcitement is on uh, your part. <laughs> they think you're much more excited to, to to reveal. I'm actually kind of scared to figure out what these presents are. All right, enough uh, foreplay. Let's talk about what we have been watching or reading. I'll go first while Will tries to figure out the name of this place in Japan. Nayagawa. Right. No, no, um, Nageyama. I, it's it's over there. Um, Isn't Nageyama a character from Haikyuu? Fuck, I don't know. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Ka- no, Kageyama. No, is from yeah, yeah, Haikyuu. Kageyama. Nayagawa. Eh, whatever. Fuck like, it. It's Japan. All right, Land of the Rising Sun. Okay, so I have been watching quite a bit. Will has watched a shit ton. Um, just just the recap, over the past month since since February 4th all the way through to March 4th, I've watched 240 episodes of anime along with three anime movies. Now, like, shorter, like, 
animated movie length. So like 59 minutes, to like an hour or five minutes, like not like full feature length, two hour, three hour movies. Um, but yeah, that came up to around 2,700 to 2,800 hours of anime or just under four hours of anime per day for over a 28 day like period. Um, I'm tired, but I, I, that's, the, that's the thing. Like with, with the whole COVID situation going on and not going outside, what the fuck are you supposed to do, right? I've got Crunchyroll, I've got Netflix, I've got Funimation, and if I need to, I could use High Dive if I really needed to, I guess if I wanted to watch season three of Takagi-san. Also, you can get Amazon Prime. Exactly. Thank like, my sister coming in clutch. At, I'm not sure if we've actually seen any anime on Disney Plus yet, but I would not doubt that there is, because they have Korean dramas on there. So I guess the next step for them would be to have um, animations on there. But, yeah, like there's just nothing to do. So, Will, um, I was going to say what I've been watching, but let's actually change uh, topics to what you've been consuming, because you have watched okay, a I'm lot. I'm just going to get these out of the way first. So these are these are series that I watched a long time ago and I just wanted to finish them up or at least like get up to speed, like get to current. Um, first things first, um, I finished watching Food Wars. Um, Food Wars season uh, one and two specifically. Um, I think I stopped around episode nine or episode ten of Food Wars about two months ago and slowly got back into it. Uh, I really like the show. The show's fantastic. It's, it's a fun like shonen like ask I say s because it, it, the 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 whole point of it is still focusing on like food competitions and cooking skills but when you start introducing the characters who have their own styles of cooking their own methodologies of understanding spices and fragrances and cooking techniques like that in itself is shonen as fuck now as much as i do like those particular aspects like i i don't like watching master chef or like kitchen nightmares and stuff like I, that. I, I do though. I think so. Th- that's that's why. Like I had to knock down the score by like one or two points. But the whole like ha- passion for cooking, the flashbacks of why people wanted to cook in the first place, those are like really heartwarming. And I do like the the shonen aspect of it as well. So in the end, I, I gave parts one and part two um, eight eight out of tens on my anime list. No, no, season one and two because. Yeah, well, season one we now live in a world where part one and the part first, two, the first plate and the second plate. Yes, that's correct. Um, this this is actually going to be really confusing because when you have season one, part two, final season, part one, part two, final season, final part, like it's Attack it, on you, Titan says hi. It's going to be fucking annoying. Um, but, but that, yeah, so that's 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 one thing. The oh, other so thing, sorry. So Food Wars is also known as Shogugeki no Soma for yeah. some people. Uh, the manga is based off of the, the same name. The same name that is published and finished. More often than not, most shows are based off of the same name. It's very rare that they end up having a different name. Kaiji isn't. But hey, look. Kaiji's um, different because Kaiji is... Okay, okay. Th- yeah, th- so now so you revealed that. We'll talk about that in like a couple minutes. Okay, okay. So, um, Shogugeki no Soma, also known in English as Food Wars, is a manga that is published in Shonen Jump. So when Will mentioned, oh, it's Shonen as fuck, of course, because it's on Shonen Jump. Uh, it's published in English by Viz Media, and the adaptation of the anime of the manga and the manga are both completed with all five seasons from beginning to end of the whole series all done by JC staff throughout the years. Yeah. So one minor criticism of JC staff, of course, is the animation quality was great in seasons one and seasons two. Season three, I watched like half of the episode and then like, this is not really a spoiler. It's been out for so long. You know that part where they go into that, that Chinese uh, cooking institution and they have all those people like stir frying on walks? The animation quality immediately went fucking terrible. And I was like, nope, stop. I'm not watching this. No, Turn no, no. It it, it, it's, it's 3D anime, 3D CGI done at its peak, man. Did not need to happen. It didn't, absolutely did not need any of that. You could just have one guy stir frying on the walk and that was it. Uh, I stopped over there. I just read everything on Wiki, and then I'm like, "There's no need for me to watch the rest of it now." Um, but yeah, it's 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 a good time. I absolutely do endorse Food Wars. Uh, just check it out. It's, I, on, it's pretty much on any platform you can look on. I it's, think if you want to ever watch Food Wars, it is a very fun time. Do not watch season five, or do not read past whatever season five starts, because well, uh, personally, from my point of view, the end of season four, which is uh, faithful to the manga as well i mean part five is all uh, season five is also faithful to the manga 
it's just terrible. I'm ready to move on to the next thing. All right, let's we go. We spent too much time on Food Wars. Uh, also, I finished up Haikyuu. Um, I'm up to to the top. Finish part one and part two. Uh, very, very good. Part one was an eight. Part two was a, oof. Part uh, part two was a nine. I uh, gave part two a ten. I it's it's not it's not season three, man. It's not quite season three. It was good though. It was very very good. I mean, like a nine out of ten is like still like amazing. So, uh, not much need to be said. We've talked about Haikyuu before in the past. Oh. Same name, published by Jump. Uh, there's also English animation, English adaptation through Viz Media. Uh, dude, it's it's all on Netflix. So, well, I will all on a- Crunchyroll. Before we move on from Haikyuu to the top, I will ask you one question, which is, are you really hyped for what comes next? Because I, I need, I need the so, continuation so, now. So I I do, but the thing is. At some point, there's a plateau with these shows, and there's only so much it can go to the point where, like, I have already experienced such crazy highs that if I were to see any more, I don't know if I would get any additional benefit from it. So I am excited to watch what season five or to the to, to the toppest of tops or whatever the fuck next part is called to the peak. Yeah, but like I'm. I'm I'm okay. Like if I have to wait like another year or two before the next part comes out, that's fine with me. I I'm I'm not that fussed. All right. I think also because there's a huge delay between to the top and season three for me, um, it made more impact. That's all. Is, is production IG working on anything else right now? I don't know. Ghost in the Shell. What's uh, 20, uh, 20, 2045 20, part two? Or yeah, whatever. exactly. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Okay. Kaiji, let's go. Um, Kaiji is fucking great. It's a essentially a gambling and sort of. If you've ever like watched, have you ever read um, Liar Game? You're asking me? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. That it's basically that, but better because of the fact that. It, it, whenever you look at these kinds of like life or death gambling games, gambling competitions, um, it's it's always very very clear that no matter the situation, the protagonist is always going to win. They always have plot armor on them. Not in Kaiji though. So Kaiji uh, is essentially well, it's a manga that's got many 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 parts, but only two of them uh, have been adapted. Uh, and only two of them are also in English. Uh, the rest of them are still in Japanese, and like the, the latest part right now is uh, still ongoing. But it's been running for well over like 16, 17 years. It's actually incredibly popular. I've actually pulled out some stats uh, because uh, one of the games that is very much focused within Kaiji is Pachinko, and I found that the Pachinko machines that are Kaiji themed are like within the top fifteen, like uh, top billing machines um can you guess which is number one demon slayer nope not even close it's fist of the north star because it had a fucking 20 year head start so <laughs> that's why um but yeah so the, the the whole focus of the show is based on this main character kaiji uh he's just a bum right has always had bad luck with things cannot hold a steady job can't maintain relationships and always falls for really easy devious plots to essentially ring him drive all his money by giving him the promise that he'd be able to gamble his way to freedom but there's always like as with gambling especially when you're gambling at a casino it's very easy to think that you have a chance to win big not true because no matter what the house always wins as long as the odds are stacked against you you're never playing to win you're playing to break the system and that's what happens throughout the whole series both part one and part two um i i don't want to go into too much depth because it just spoils most of the series but as kaiji starts growing and growing throughout the series you start realizing that this guy is like he he, he turns from being this person who tries to trust everybody to be able to succeed in life to become a little more cold a little more devious a little bit more conniving um it it definitely dives deeper into like the depths of like human immorality uh i absolutely love it it's 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 not like crazy edgy but you definitely see like the worst in human beings um it's it's a fun time i i highly recommend i gave both seasons one and two uh a nine out of ten like very very highly recommended now i will say this because i know jesus is going to bring it up I understand that the character designs are kind of weird. 
all right like there's like very sharp noses very long chins very pinocchio-esque i don't really have much of a problem with it i think it's actually quite nice to be able to see something a little bit different because whenever you're looking at anime and manga when all characters have the same exact character design there's nothing wrong with wanting to be a little bit different and staying away from the crowd. So I kind of actually appreciate the difference because it, it it allows for more contorted and, and, and extreme facial expressions. And that's what happens when you're dealing with gambling situations that are talking about hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars. And the, when you reach the depths of depravity and you reach the highest of highs of ecstasy, you want to be able to see that full range of of human emotion and i think that kaiji does it really well and the, the whole weird character design lends to it perfectly um so i i can't uh, reckon anymore it's 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 it, any higher it's, it's it's a nine out of ten really really good time uh go ahead check it out crunchy roll that shit and it's also uh produced by studio madhouse during their heyday for uh season one in fall 2007 and season two in spring 2011 so it's like madhouse like per, in a at that point a pretty good studio i mean madhouse was always a great studio but before the fall basically you will see that like the difference between seasons one and season two is pretty stark like the animation quality jumps i mean when i was watching it on crunchyroll it was only limited to 4080p a 480p on like season one but then season two it upscales all the way through to full hd so it's it, it's night and day but the character designs are consistent throughout i absolutely loved it um I, I, I'm trying to convince Jason to watch it, but for some reason, he doesn't like Pinocchio faces, so you guys listening, go ahead and check it out, and then let Jason know that it's, it's worth watching. Absolutely, let me know. Uh, so, I have been watching and reading a bunch of stuff, but I'll only mention one thing that I've been watching and one thing that I've been reading. When I was looking through sort of the catalog of anime that are available to me, I was thinking of watching a show that was more you know, relaxing slice of life and maybe a bit more freedom than uh, the current situation because it's pretty restrictive at the moment in terms of staying at home, which is mostly by choice, but still, right? Then I remembered, Will, when you were growing up, do you remember kind of having a secret hideout with your friends, playing all these really stupid games with yourself, or trying to solve cases, or trying to, you know, be like a savior or a hero of a town, and everyone else, like, around you is like, oh, look at them being cute little kids, doing cute little kids things, and, you know, being all innocent and nice. And No, I just went to my friend's house and played Resident Evil. Okay. Well, there is an anime that premiered in winter that does exactly the opposite of what i did as a kid right? exactly that's Win why i have no affiliation no no affinity whatsoever to what you're about to say but yeah go for it so this anime premiered in winter 2018 and is produced by silverlink it is based off of the manga series of the same name written and illustrated by katsuo but there is no english translation to my knowledge so you just got the anime it is mitsuboshi colors which is one season about three girls uh, one is very red color oriented, one is very yellow color oriented, and one is very blue color oriented. And it just talks about them at those, um, you know, those district shopping malls in Ueno, which is a district in Tokyo. And just about them going about their business day to day at a secret hideout. You ever been to Ueno? Yes. It's a packed ass train station. There's oh. not much of a shopping district there, but like you can find them. But it is it is a very, very dense part of Japan. I think the shopping district itself is right under the train station. So it's incredibly busy with commuters and people going off to work and all that. And it's just about these three girls. I think at one point they literally spend... Uh, okay, here okay, I'm going to spoil a little bit of a plot because they do like skits. So a girl, a high school girl has a allergy to pollen and they're like... Yo, we like you. You seem to be suffering because of pollen allergies. Let's kill all the trees. And they proceed to attempt to do that. Obviously, they were unsuccessful, but it's cute as fuck and a slice of life. And that basically is the anime for 12, 13 episodes. It's pretty good. It's really good, actually. Um, if you like that sort of them running around, 
causing mischief, but also trying to save the it's, world. It's just basically a young kid's detective club kind of thing, right? Absolutely. It's like Ghost Rider. Do you remember that show? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like that, except there is no Ghost Rider. It's just kids doing kids stuff. Okay. Um, I mean, have you finished it? Yeah, I did. It would, I mean, what, what would you give it out of a, t- like a 10? Uh, 8 out of 10. I would give it an 8 out of 10 for sure. Uh, it's a fun ride. It was really nice, but it wasn't necessarily anything groundbreaking. So it's very enjoyable, though. You should watch it. Now. Nah. <laughs> yeah, okay. It doesn't, doesn't really sound like I'm going to enjoy this. It's fine. I have, I have other slice of life that follow around two or three girls doing their own cute girl things. I but, mean, Slow Loop wants to talk to you. But what happens, Will, when... Um, what happens what? When instead What happens of, when? When two to three... What happens when Jason starts off with what happens when? Yeah, yeah, I know, right? Instead of two to three girls, what happens you get a hundred... And they really, 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 really love you. And they're also all your girlfriends. I've been talking about this series for a long time. The first volume of the manga came out recently by Seven Seas Entertainment. And it is also known as 100 Girlfriends. And the full title is The 100 Girlfriends Who Really, 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 Really Love You. It is about a guy who, uh, Rentaro, who got rejected almost all his life. And because of that, he went to a temple to pray. And all of a sudden, a deity shows up and is like, yo, you're going to meet your soulmate. But I kind of fucked up because usually everyone just gets one soulmate. But I kind of added two zeros. So instead, you're going to get 100 soulmates. And if you don't you know, get together with your soulmate, they're going to suffer a horrible death because you know, that's fate and destiny and all that. And he's like, well, shit. How about I date all of them at the same time? And he proceeds to do so and introduces one to literally the harem. I mean, this is just a harem paradise kind of thing, right? Yeah, but it is done in the most slapstick referential meta way. They all, they constantly break the fourth wall. They're like, oh, yo, why hasn't this person shown up? Um, they showed up in volume uh, in chapter one, but like, what the hell, man? Or like, they would be like, this panel cannot fit all this text. This is not good. We should blame the mangaka. Like, they actually call out themselves. So it's very like Deadpool kind of like fourth wall breaking, and it's also quite sweet because, uh, yeah. And the first volume only introduces I think two or three of the one hundred girlfriends, and I'm presumably there would be introduced the other ninety seven eventually. So the interesting thing is that it's serialized in Young Jump and not regular Jump, right? So is there anything in the material that suggests that it's for like an older audience? Outside of, of course, the fact that it is a harem pool of a manga. Absolutely not. There is very little nudity or violence at all. Right. So I'm wondering why it's on Young Jump. I mean, it, may, it might just be the source. It might just be the material itself. I mean, the fact that it is a guy who's literally trying to create a cluster of girls to fit into a light, nice little harem portfolio. And the thing is that Rentoro is like the most straight edge, pure person possible because he has been rejected so many times. So he feels the pain and the passion and he's just a nice guy. So it's really funny how all these girls fall for him and he tries to be equally loving to all of them. So yeah, okay, there's it starts off with two or three, but when you get, I don't know how it's going to work when you get to like 20, for example. Forget about 100. Like, how are you going to balance all 20 quote unquote girlfriends? My question is here that I think we've, we've talked about this before, but like the way that it's going and what we've seen with like anime adaptations, this seems like a prime candidate for an adaptation, right? I absolutely but, think so. But what, what studio do you think would. I, I, we've talked Passione being like a front runner for this one just because the fact that they do. Really, really fucking etchy, harem esque adaptations all the time. But do you, do you have any others that you think might have a might have a shot in getting an adaptation for this? I honestly don't know, but I would be of the mindset that there's absolutely no way that this won't get adapted. I mean, it also sounds like a Duga Kobo kind of thing too, right? Duga Kobo can do anything right now, basically, and I would still be okay. OLM, I will not. You never know. Wow, you don't think OLM? They did Comey. Yeah, but like, 
look at all the other stuff that they did is like some are good some are great and then there are some that are not so great so they're up and down you know it depends I, I mean I, I feel that's the same with a lot of other studios right? I mean you like, can say so, it about so, production so, IG so, right Silverlink is the same too right absolutely I, so I would say it's like it, it's it's not always down to the studio it's, I mean unless it's JC staff and like JC staff will always find ways to fuck things up but like for the most part I think it just comes down to the source material and if the material's good enough and you seem to be like really on this 100 girlfriends wave like I I feel like they have enough material in there to be able to consistently produce good shit. I, I'm not too worried about what studio they would get to do it. But again, like we're so far away from an adaptation even being announced, like we might just wait until like episode sixty of the podcast and let you all know. Hey, there's an adaptation coming. But it needs to happen soon, Will, because uh, a long, long time ago we got Domestic Girlfriend, right? Yeah. And then the la the next year after that we got Rent a Girlfriend. We got Rent a Girlfriend, and then. Last year we got girlfriend, girlfriend. So if they don't premiere this year, they're gonna lose the streak. Anime is gonna lose that streak. I I would give them the uh, the COVID grace period, in which we would say that if it's not released by twenty twenty three, then they've broken the streak. Fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 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 so there's like a little asterisk. But... Exactly. We're we're giving it a grace period. All right. That is what we have been watching or reading, and. We also have a surprising amount of news to talk about. It's, it's, I mean, like, oh, man, a lot has happened. A fuck ton has happened. Um, but I think the first thing we need to talk about is um, something that actually happened a long time ago. When Episode we about, three. Yeah, when we talked about the, uh, the, essentially the merger between Funimation and Crunchyroll. Um, so we were always talking about like, well, what's going to happen to the catalog, what's going to happen to the, the apps themselves, the UI, uh, are things going to change, are they going to be changing uh, subscription plans for people? Well, the first step has come in. Funimation's anime content is now going to be merging and going to the Crunchyroll platform, which Jason and I both, both agree is a really good move because I use Crunchyroll way more than Funimation. And I think same with Jason too. Yeah, I also think that, oh, first of all, it wasn't episode three that we talked about. Crunchyroll is episode four. Okay. Um, but so episode three was proliferation, right? No, it was adaptation. Proliferation right. and stigmatization is five. But uh, wow, it's been a long time. Yeah, it has been a long time, huh? So many more is to come, hopefully. But Funimation in general, when it uh, it their reputation is not great. Their app in general is considered by many to be inferior to Crunchyroll. Way more restricted in terms of regions as well. Exactly. And also their uh, subtitles and dubs have received certain backlashes based off of people translating them as well as uh, voice actors and actresses dubbing the anime. But now, now, to be fair, when it comes to translation for subs, most platforms aren't perfect. I mean, like, there's been enough complaints about Netflix and their quality of translations, but I think, like... Funimation has been much more of a consistent culprit in this. And a longer, like they have existed for yeah. far longer. So it makes a lot of sense to integrate Funimation with Crunchyroll rather than the other way around. I was more talking about like the translation in general because they remember they had the Squid Game controversy with uh, with Netflix. Um, so it has been going on for a while. But Funimation, if we're talking like anime specifically, yes. then yeah, Funimation has a pretty bad track record when it comes to dubbing and subbing controversies. So... There is a long, long list of subs and dubs of anime that are now available. Yeah, on we, should, we should do a little clarification on this, right? So, if you do actually access the link or you see what's moved over from Funimation over to the Crunchyroll platform, it doesn't mean that, like, oh, all of a sudden it's like, oh, like we have Bungo Straight Dogs in here now. Oh, we have Data Live 3. We have Fruits Baskets. Like, no, they always existed on the Crunchyroll platform, they just existed as the sub version so you would have japanese voices english subtitles now they're now including the dubbed versions that existed on the funimation platform and are now moving into crunchyroll right so some things are like dr stone fire force fruits basket high school dxd um kageyasama those things are now also available in dub when you're accessing it through crunchyroll but then there's also a healthy amount of both new shows that are sub and dub so for example a show that I quite like is Adachi and Shimamura that's on there. Akudama Drive that Will and I have been talking about since the dawn of existence. Y'all, you really have to check it out. That's available for sub and dub. So, oh my God, Tokyo Gold Dove is on here too. Yeah, Woo! I know, right? Oh, fuck uh, that shit. Oh God. And there's a bunch of shows, just a lot. One actually that really got my attention is Full Dive. This ultimate next gen Full Dive RPG is even shittier than real life. Um, 
I, I may check that out just based on the title alone. So all of a sudden, guys, your Crunchyroll catalog, at least in terms of subs and dubs, have now increased significantly. Will and I think that at least based on what we know, the Funimation shows, all of them have not transitioned to Crunchyroll yet. And we believe that these moves will come in waves. Yeah, this, this is not the most extensive and exhaustive list. This is just the first active update. So come back in, check out when there is like new stuff that goes on there. But you know, fear not. Even if it's like new stuff that's coming up from Funimation, the Crunchyroll catalog, at least in the US, is already super stacked. So adding the stuff onto it now just means you have more options to watch stuff that you previously watched. And you maybe want to watch it in English dubs instead of subs. Uh, or there's also stuff that's on, that wasn't on there before. Like I didn't know that Cowboy Bebop wasn't on Crunchyroll. They're moving the whole sub and dub from Funimation onto Crunchyroll. So look, it's it's time to get back on the anime train. If you can't go outside, hey, watch this, watch Akadama Drive. It's on, it's on Crunchyroll now. So at that Shin Shimamura, watch that shit too. It's gonna be a good time. Yes. Um, and don't watch by the grace of gods, though. That is absolutely garbage. Yeah, I heard it wasn't that great. It keeps being recommended to me on Netflix too, and I'm like, no, I do not want to watch any more of this shit. Like, please turn off these. I I, I want to actually be able to like turn on like not interested or ignore. Like, cause you can do it on YouTube. I don't know if you can do it on Netflix. But one anime series that you cannot ignore this season is Dress Up Darling. That is an anime that you can't ignore it if it's not your cup of tea. But thankfully, it is mine. I'm 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 really happy that I actually ended up checking out Dress Up Darling. I really like Dress Up Darling as well, and I think a lot of people agree. Last episode, or maybe two episodes before, we talked about how since the anime debuted, a bunch of uh, manga got bought in Japan. I think another one million copies were in circulation. Well, guess what? Since then, another 1.5 million copies are in circulation now since the anime premiered. So it jumped up even more. And I thought, like, oh, it won't go on forever, Will. Like, this growth just cannot sustain itself. I have um, I have to eat my words just a little bit because as of right now, it has jumped more, not sustained, increased. I mean, with each episode that comes up, right, you get to see more and more of these. I mean, it's dude, it's wholesome. It's gorgeous. I wasn't even talking about the wholesome part. It's just it's just boobs and legs, man. Uh, yeah, I mean, fan service, man. Yeah, that's fan service done right. Yeah. Gloss over it with the wholesome part, too. There's absolutely nothing wholesome about it. It's just boobs it's just tna but hey like that's also like half the reason why people watch it no no shame whatsoever but did you know will that actually dress up darling is not necessarily all about cosplaying and tna yeah there's actually if you you remember gojo the main character when he first started off he was essentially a hina doll like aficionado basically his whole room is just hina dolls with all the paints all the little clothes even just like rows of like Hina head so you can it's make, his family he, business he, he, that's why it's like if you take away the dress up part that actually is how he got started in like his own art form um but it, it hasn't really been much of a focus throughout though occasionally when you start deep diving deeper into gojo's background into his life they start taking more of a forefront and you can see why he has so much passion for the medium and that's actually then bled into real life as well so there has been a spike in terms of popularity for Hina dolls after the debut of My Dress of Darling, once it got animated, uh, the anime adapted. Uh, it, I, I actually haven't, re- I, I've never bought a Hina doll, but it, you see it everywhere whenever you go around Japan. Well, I don't think you can because I think they're exclusively for girls. No, I mean, when you buy them. Oh, when you buy them. Yeah, okay. But yeah, what, 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 is, what does that have to do with anything with girls? You I, I thought, you I thought it's like a ceremonial. Okay, I'm going to, I'm I, sorry, this is. I don't know. I don't know. That's why you can get them. Absolutely no problem. But a lot of people want them because since the anime debuted, Hina dolls have been massively popular to the point where Dress Up Darling now gets their own official Hina doll. That's the third news. So not only are more manga in circulation, now Hina dolls have a spike in popularity, and then they decided to have an official My Dress Up Darling Hina doll. There you go, guys. Yeah, it's all about the merch. In the end, right, we we knew that with the way that anime gets adapted, it's usually like a long glorified advertisement for the source material, for whatever merchandise it can sell. So in order to be able to 
you know reaping the rewards they have to be able to have some sunk costs that's to the benefit of the of, of of the crowd as well though it's like yes like we get to watch more anime and because we like the anime therefore we're definitely going to invest more time and money into it i i absolutely see no problem with this whatsoever it's really cool that they're able to turn something that was originally just like fiction into reality and i would like to see like you know if anybody wants to go and pick up some hina dolls hey you got some real life just up darling hina dolls to go sh- get it, it it's official too not knock up shit official shit so if you really like dress up darling if you like hina dolls after checking it out you can buy that shit now okay our next news story concerns a video game that i played to completion will have you ever played this video game i got bored of it honestly I, got, I actually got really bored of it, but I, I you have to admit that Near Automata, which is the game in question, is incredibly gorgeous. The soundtrack, the sound design is really, really good. I just, I, I just can't be bothered to finish it. I really like Near Automata. Uh, the, the game is really surprising in terms of what I thought it was and then what it ends up becoming. Uh, people freak out when you say you have to beat the game several times. That is actually true. There's 24 endings. You don't need to play all 24 times. There, I think there's mainly five or six main endings. And each time you play it, the the game actually changes. You don't play the story from beginning to end. That's exactly the same, even though there are stuff that are the same. But it's a really good RPG, action RPG. And they're getting their own anime. So there you go. Yeah, that, that was the news itself. We're not talking about the game. We're talking about the fact that I got an anime adaptation. Um, no, no, no news yet on who's adapting it, when it's going to get released. But look, if you like the near game series, go ahead. It's it's time for you to now watch it in anime form. Yeah, they announced it during their fifth anniversary live stream. So Aniplex said that, uh, hey, we're going to do an anime adaptation. No other further announcements. Yeah. So that's not the only uh, animation adaptation news that we have. We have another one, which is. Um, essentially a, a throwback series uh, for anybody who was down for the classic Spice and Wolf fantasy novels. Uh, they had seasons one and seasons two, both of which are on Netflix. Um, they're now coming up with new anime. So, hey, Spice and Wolf fans rejoice. It's been a long time since I've been waiting. I think the second season came out in 2007? 2009. 2008 yeah. and 2009. So uh, I quite like Spice and Wolf a lot. Uh, the, the anime is very dry in a way because it's about economics and trading. It's just merchants traveling around and a wolf girl. Yes, but it is done very well. The dialogue and character development is great. I never thought that there would be more beyond the two seasons. And uh, I think... But did you want more to come? Yes, right. because the story wasn't completed. And I think uh, Will doesn't agree with this, but I think that there is a very healthy amount of people that wanted a continuation of Spice and Wolf. And uh, I mean, I, I didn't say there wasn't. I said there would be more people who wanted Devil's a Part Timer. And I said, and there are stats that back it up too, because if you look at how many fans there are on my anime list for Spice and Wolf, there's seven hundred thousand, and there's double the amount for Devil's a Part Timer. So I'm not again. I have to be clear. I'm not saying that Spice and Wolf does not deserve it, nor did I want it. I'm saying that there was always going to be a healthier amount of people who wanted other things, and then the Spice of Wolf thing came out of nowhere. Whereas it, every year it was like, why is Devil Part Time not coming out? Why is this not coming out? And I don't know. Maybe it's just the circles that I'm in, but Spice and Wolf was never really something that came up in discussion. Uh, yes. So I am actually very surprised by this announcement, but I am also very happy about this announcement. Just like how oh Konosuba is getting new anime project. Regardless, right? It's just good to have more stuff to consume. To but, be fair, though, Konosuba didn't come out that long ago. No, you're right. I'm yeah. just saying, like, a bunch of stuff get announced after a period of time of just silence, right? Like, Chiafuru also had a period of silence. Yeah, that one was, like, six years. It was the same thing with Attack on Titan as well. Like, 2013 through to 2019, nothing. And then part two comes out. Woof. So... What Will and I actually tr- are trying to say is, no game, no life. You are on fucking watch. it up. You, you guys are-, are screwing shit up right now. Why the fuck is there no no game, no life too? Why are we still waiting since Zero came out only like six years ago, seven years ago, 2015, right? That's when it came out. So like, come on, guys, get your shit together. It's been ten years since No Game, No Life, the first part. Even Shaman King came back, bro. Look. You, you want to be late to the party? You want to be the VIP? That's fine. But, like, you know, RSVP that shit. 
be on the ball so then you can show up to the ball and, you know, be the most beautiful girl ever. God. Just, we got blindsided. What was, what was the other old school, uh, Utena? Ut- U- U-T-E-N-A. Oh, yeah, the one with the girl in the leopard the, the, print. Ye- le- leopard yellow print dress. Ah, yeah, I forgot. We, you know which one I'm talking no, about. No, Utena is a revolutionary girl, which is different. Yeah, so, okay, that we'll, we'll, we'll figure out the name later on. When that shit came out in the 80s, and it's getting a revamp now, like, come on, man. Like, if that can get a revamp, no game, no life, you guys can get your shit together and make part two. All right. Our last news story, though, is... This is not even fucking, like... It's not adaptation. It's not like industry news. This is just some crazy fandom, like WTF shit. <laughs> so, do you actually experience this? Well? Actually, okay. When was the last time you went to an Anticon? That's a very good question. I don't think the last I time ever... I went to an Anticon was ten years ago in Vancouver. I don't... long, long time ago. I don't think I ever went to an anime convention like in there i was always like on the outskirts because i didn't want to buy a ticket or a pass or whatever so i was one of those assholes but the thing is that with any cons there's always those things that are like the 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 standards that come with it right you'll have like that j-rock band that comes in or like that va that comes in that does like a musical performance you have like those people who they do essentially like cosplay competitions merchandise merchandise uh there's always the, the the etchy adults only section which is always like you got the good quality uh, cultural uh, cultured stuff there, but there's one subset within the Anticon fandom culture that we haven't really seen for a while, and I did see it a lot when I was at my first and actually my only Anticon, um, Yaoi paddles. So this is actually something that has historical significance within the anime community in North America. It's very hard to explain the history in a short period of time. However, um, we'll do the best we can. <laughs> we'll do the best we can. There is a vendor called Hendane, uh, and they, as a joke, uh, had a, a paddle, like, you know, like the, the ones that like fraternities have, and they had Yaoi written on it. And... Um, Yaoi is basically boy love stuff. And it it was just on there. And then apparently a bunch of people were like, oh, I want that paddle. And they were like, no, no, no. This is just like a joke that like our staff had and we just brought it. And then long story short, they were like, wait, we can actually earn money off of this. So let's sell these paddles. And then they sold like fucking hotcakes. It was insane. Everyone basically had a paddle. So you're thinking like, oh, that's great, right? People are earning money. Well... When you um, buy a paddle, you theoretically would be inclined to want to use it. And what ends up happening over, I guess, several years was these people who bought these paddles start hitting people out of nowhere. Not even asking consensual or whatever. Just like, oh, there's a cosplayer? Let's just whack her ass or whack his ass because everyone just got, like, hit. Now, we're not saying that this is, like, a very natural occurrence of like standard abuse, but it's like paddle. This thing is made out of solid wood. And when you put it in the hands of anybody, there's always going to be that one person that has to ruin it for the party. And unfortunately, because of that one person or that several groups of people, now it's been deemed that if you bring a paddle in any item that re- like resembles like something that can be used as a weapon or for harassment banned, not allowed to be in conventions anymore. It looks like a, uh, like a smaller imagine, cricket paddle. Ima- yeah, exactly. Imagine like a cricket paddle, but it's in the shape of like a baseball bat. It's like flat. It's flat like a cricket bat. With and, Yahweh written on it. it. Yeah. It, 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 yo, if you've ever been hit by like a solid chunk of wood, like a two by two, or like any, I mean, I've been hit by a baseball bat before, it fucking hurts. Like Even if it's a small tap, like it, you just don't want that shit, especially if you're out on your day, enjoying your cosplay day out, or you're going out to go get your manga sign because the manga is there. And all of a sudden, someone just slaps your ass the paddle. Like I would be pretty pissed about it too. Like you can understand, like it's a fun little subset, but there is always someone that has to take it too far. Yeah, and that's when shit gets a little too real. I think in the beginning there were a bunch of people doing it like as a joke, but then it was like consensual in the sense that like, oh, we bought the paddle. Uh, why don't you like smack the creator? So it was like everyone kind of knew what was happening, was all informed. But then, as Will mentioned, you get the party poopers. 
the one rogue agent that's like, yeah, I'm just going to like smack every single cosplayer I see. And that's eventually what happened. And all these uh, conventional goers started complaining. And all these convention organizers eventually had to put down the band hammer, basically, and say, no more yaoi paddles. Well, actually, you know, riffing off of that, you know, when it comes to party pooping. Um, so after the original post came out, I think Jason did update that um, since the release of the Kickstarter for these oh, yaoi paddles. Wait, so so we actually didn't mention all that. We just now yeah. mentioned the history. So, yeah. so there's, now there's a little bit of controversy when it comes to it as well. So the reason why we're mentioning this h- brief history lesson is because on Kickstarter, a yaoi paddle Kickstarter has been announced to revitalize this anime fandom. Yeah, so it, it it blew up. Everyone's like, yes, let's fucking do this. It's going to be great. However, the doujin vendor Hen Dane, which Jason mentioned previously, is now basically putting out a intellectual property dispute filing, um, which is basically involving a copyright dispute for the Yaoi Paddle Fan Kickstarter. Basically, they're accusing that the Kickstarter, the people who started it, stole the design of these Yaoi paddles, that they were never uh, given permission to do so, and that Hendan and were never even asked for permission. So since then, the Kickstarter campaign is now unavailable, and who knows what's going to happen with it now. Because another thing that you might want to consider is the fact that this paddle, or like the... the con- controversy or the infamous paddle has caused a lot of problems for this company who created it and they had to do a bunch of stuff to even recoup their reputation so when all of a sudden you see kind of basically the exact same thing that you saw 10 years ago that caused a lot of problems at these conventions you would be like oh it's done by the same company but actually no and then there's legal disputes and basically now the Kickstarter is frozen. So it's a bunch of similar to AnyTube in terms of like, oh, did you actually get permission? Or like very lofty uh, expectations were placed that were assumptions. And a lot of naive people were like, yeah, that's cool. But then when you think about it, it's like, actually, not really. Yeah. Well, there's still like some developments there too, right? So the the person who actually started up uh, the Kickstarter, Henry A.L., is now saying that like we're going to contest uh, this filing um, because technically it's not the same design. So it's not that... You know, Hendane holds the whole copyright for it. Hendane then says, that, "Well, it's you know legally art design because it's an embodiment of you know what these paddles mean. That's why like we're filing these copyrights uh, claims. So it's it's still an ongoing process. Who knows what's going to happen about it? But it was just funny that this all of a sudden just came out. It's like I have not I have not seen or heard of Yaoi paddles in the longest time, and all of a sudden now this is like a thing again. Exactly." I would like to say, though, my personal opinion of this is Henry A.L. mentioned, and I quote, This is meant to be used only for keepsake, no more dangerous than a wooden spoon in the kitchen, and arguing that no one is actually going to be able to bring a paddle to a convention. Now, that's nice for you to say, but at the same time, bullshit. You you can't. Well, I mean, no, I I, I do agree that what he's saying is true because he needs to speak legalese, right? He needs to put this out so that if there was ever an incident of someone misusing the pedal, then he's already got himself off scot-free. The issue is that you're talking about human beings here. Yes. It's like what can happen and what probably will happen. What should happen or what can happen is no one does anything bad. It's just kept as a keepsake, as this guy says, and it's just chill it's just like a good memorabilia of at that time that was a trendy messed up thing remember that guys but really people are gonna yeah but again it's also like he's doing it to make sure that like look there are gonna be stupid people who do this i'm just saying this straight up i mean imagine it's like imagine like you you're 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 um you're joseph joseph and you make like kitchen equipment you sell knives are you going to tell people, no, these knives are not for hurting people. They're just for kitchen use. Like, are you going to go do that? Like, it, it, like you can understand why Henry has to go out and say this shit. Oh, I, I, I understand why you have to say it. Yeah. But so, like, I wouldn't say bullshit on his end. I'm saying that it's bullshit like, that in people reality, are, are going to listen to you. Yeah, re- that's what I meant. I, yeah. I, I don't want to, like, mis, misconstrue uh, Henry A.L. I'm just saying practically, like, in real life, in Human reality. Human beings are stupid. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, don't do that. Like, just don't tempt fate. That's it. 
So I know what to get you for your birthday then, Jason. Fuck. <laughs> get a Yuri paddle. <laughs> Yuri paddle? Do they even exist? <laughs> uh, they do. They No, they definitely did. I, okay. I did some research and they definitely exist. Okay, all right. <laughs> research. Okay, got it. <laughs> so that brings up the end of our news, I think, right? Like, Yeah. Yeah, fuck. we went overboard. Holy shit. There was a lot. Well, I mean, look, like adaptations coming up here and there, like, they're always going to be great. But like, it's it's stuff that like we we know, like, hey, Spice and Wolf coming back, that's going to be great. People who like the near Automata games, yo, now you get to watch a shit in anime form. There's going to be a lot more stuff that comes up soon as well. I mean, who knows? In the next in the next two weeks, there may be more news. To come. I mean, shit. Like they're not talking about like the new titles for like the the slime Isakai film. There's going to be more stuff coming out. Like for example, Uzaki Chan. Like the new subtitle casts are coming out. There's going to be more and more information that comes out every week. But we also want to make sure that we consolidate everything so that we hope that it's information that makes sense to you. We're not going to be covering every adaptation, every manga, every every light novel that is about to like hit the fucking screen. I mean, do you really want to hear, oh, this anime, which is already scheduled to premiere in spring, has announced that their premiere date is April 7th or whatever. There is like, there's no need for that. There's no need for that. There is a shit ton of those. We know they exist. You probably know they exist if you were to you know, go on these anime news sites. So we just decided to go for some funny stuff, some important stuff, and some stuff that just we personally find interesting that we think you guys should know about. So that's really it. I um, mean, shit, like Netflix just announced a brand new anime adaptation of Kazushi Hagiwara's Bastard, Bastard manga. It's like, but what the fuck is Bastard? Right, it like, looks it looks like a heavy metal it's, kind of yeah. I mean, know. it came out in 1993, done by AIC Studio, which we talked about before during our sports anime episode. But like, we don't know shit about it. There's absolutely no indication of whether this is going to be good or not. So we're not going to bring that to you. We're going to check it out later, and then we'll be talking about it in the future. But we try and curate our news so that it is as relevant and as current uh, to your expectations and to your wish list. So and also stupid. Yeah, like if we like it, we like it. If we don't like it, we're not going to talk about it. All right. I think that is the end of the first half of this episode. When we come back, though, several things are going to happen. We are going to talk about our main discussion topic. Oh, wait. Do you want to do like the, the present reveal now or do you want to do it after no, the break? No, do it after. Okay. Do it after the break. Right. So um, stay tuned. And uh, it's going to be a good one, guys. The second half. See you guys. This is yeah, going to be a fucking fun time. Catch you all later. Peace. Welcome back to episode 29, part two of today's GAP podcast. I need to make sure that we're doing part two, season two, sections and all that, because with the way anime is going on, everything's a bit of a clusterfuck. But it's not a clusterfuck with the GAP hosts. It's still Will, still Jason. How are you doing, buddy? Yo, let's get this show on the road. Right. So after like that slew of news and the catch-ups that we've been doing in terms of what we've been watching, what we've been reading, we're now going to go into today's main discussion topic. Now, this is actually... We haven't even done many continuations or series within the GAP. I know that we do our... like seasonal discussions we do our anime awards but this is the first time that we're actually going to be doing a series within the gap which is the gotta watch them all so if you remember from the last episode that we did for the gotta watch them all i think it was episode 19 or episode 20 20 yeah so we essentially embarked on a long journey uh, one of which for Jason is to watch the JoJo's Bizarre Adventure series. And for me, it's to watch the Monogatari series. So for our first parts, I watched the Bucket Monogatari section. Jason watched the first section of season one, which is Phantom Blood. And we you know, laid out our, our thoughts and opinions on it. And so far, we both agreed that you know going into each other's territory, me doing Monogatari and Jason being the sage of the Monogatari series and vice versa with the Judges of Bizarre Adventure world, we like what we've seen so far. So we want to continue it. And now with part two, Jason will now be going over part two of season one. Battle Tendency, and I'll be going over Kizu Monogatari and Nisei Monogatari. Uh, we, we have a lot of opinions on everything we've watched. And, I mean, the main thing is that it's it's been a very, very fun time so far. I do not regret going on this Monogatari series journey. And neither have I regretted going on this JoJo's most bizarre adventure. 
So a bit the of, mostest bizarrest adventures, yeah. So as Will very eloquently stated, he watched Kizu Monogatari, which consists of three movies, and Nisei Monogatari. I would also want to emphasize that um, there are various watch orders of the Monogatari series, and the one that we're sticking to, which I will put in the show notes, is the light novel release order, which in my opinion as well is the order that a lot of people, especially first-timers, should go by. Yeah, it's a little bit confusing, but the reason why we do this is because the fact that Kizu Monogatari, which is the, the movie series, is technically in the second order of the light novel order, but because the movies actually came out like many, many years, I think it was in development hell for like eight, nine years before it actually came out. It started coming out between 2016 through to 2017, so it did take a while for those things to come out. And therefore, if you wanted to watch it in the full light novel order, you did have to rewatch it all over again. But I think for most Monogatari fans or appreciators, there's no issue with that whatsoever because it's 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 a fucking great time. Uh, do you want to go straight into it? I see that we have a, a, a special section that comes in before that. Right. But before we do that is um, I would watch, as Will said, uh, part two of JoJo, which is known as Battle Tendency, which is also... Uh, the the last seventeen episodes of season one of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Yep. So nine episodes for Phantom Blood, seventeen for Balten. See a total of twenty six episodes, two curves for the season one of JoJo. Confusing now, as not, not it's not us confusing though. Now I am a man of planning ahead and calculations. Does not mean I can perform very well, but when it comes to planning, I would like to think that I do a lot of it. It's S tier for sure, man. (laughs) And because of that, I somehow managed to convince Will to plan it such that this episode would be recorded on this day, which was the day before his birthday. I mean, was it planning? Was it coincidence? I mean, it it just so happened that like with our release schedule that it did fall on my birthday weekends. I guess it, it wasn't too hard to jigger things up and then put it into an order where we would do a Jojo Omonogatari episode on my birthday weekend, which actually I could not have asked for anything more. Yep. So therefore, I decided to purchase a gift for Will. And originally, this gift was, I thought, was going to take a long time for it to deliver. So therefore, I bought it in like December or January. It arrived, both of them actually arrived wicked soon, wicked early. So Will is now going to see it for the very first time. Yeah, I have at no idea what the presents are as Jason like, pack, unpacks everything. Um, excuse the noise. This, I mean, this is a a very janky setup, um, but we're doing the best we can with, uh, with regards to how COVID has essentially locked off our regular uh, recording studio. So, Will, before uh, I give a, a bit of a preamble, you like JoJo quite a bit, right? Uh, I fucking love JoJo. So... Okay, I don't like where this is going. Oh, yeah. Do I like? I do like it actually. Hmm. Would you say JoJo is up there in terms of one of oh, top ten series for sure for you, right? Personally, yeah. Would you say then, therefore, uh, the art is pretty dope? Yes, I I love Araki's artwork. Okay, I know, yeah, I, and, I know exactly where this is and going. And then, have you considered that maybe this person has you know have a lot of influences in like. The Louvre, you know, Versace, and all these Gucci, like, Gucci, and all these well-known Vogue, brands, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I decided to go back in time and then go back to recent time. So, first of all, your first, which one? Yeah, which which order are you doing? Are you doing the the Amazon Prime one, or are you going to do the one that came from Japan? Yeah, we're going to do the one that came from Japan. So, oh my god, yo, yeah. This is the magazine. Uh, this is the hardcover book that came out in 1993, I think, or 1995. Holy shit! What is it, Will? The the, the, the listeners cannot uh, s- it's an see art it. Book. It's an art book, but what is it an art book of? Well, first of all, it's got the diamonds and breakable main characters. It's also got every single JoJo leading up to part four. So no, Jorno. So this is uh, for the listeners because they can't see oh, this. I got Palmer off in here as well. This is the art book for JoJo that was published in the 1990s. Uh, it is called, um, let's see, it's called JoJo 6251. 
And not only uh, do I have it, oh, they even have like a special section a section for Jo Julian as well. The, the part eight. Oh my god! There you go. And it also contains exclusive artwork as well as an interview. Unfortunately, it's all in Japanese. But in order to even appreciate the art, you don't need to know language. Oh my god! They have character data on every single character as well. Exactly. Oh, holy shit. Yes. Okay, I can't show you. This is all spoilers for you. But but it is all in hardcover. Looks gorgeous. I mean, I flipped through it very briefly. Uh, I didn't understand most of it. They in give term- every single stat for all the stands as well. Holy shit. That is a codex of JoJo. A timeline of every single JoJo event as well. Oh, my God. This is... Yo. Okay. So, okay. So, okay. So, that's the first half of your gift. So, then, did you know, Will, that there was a second art book that came out? I would. I wouldn't doubt it, but... Did you also know that it came out rather recently? And here you have the second half of your birthday present, which is JoJo. The, the, the Jojonical? Exactly. So it's wrapped. It hasn't been opened. And it is basically the continuation of the JoJo art, as well as commentary. And, and an interview with Araki as well. Exactly. And exclusive art book stuff. Unfortunately, I can only get the Japanese version because all the English versions are either not printed or they are only coming well, out in digital I want, version. I want the original shit. I want the Japanese shit, man. And guess what? You have both of them oh, in its God. original packaging, all brand new, ready to go. So, happy birthday, When bro. you said JoJo, I was I was really afraid. Like, Did you just buy me like JoJo figures? Because those things are really expensive. Yeah, I wouldn't go that far. But I would say this, which was... I inquired about getting a signature for the first JoJo book. Uh, it was not possible. Right. It was technically possible, but it's not possible. Okay. So I did not go down that route. But I was like... Yeah, talk- you, you got me a Rocky signature. I would flip shit. Holy fuck. Yeah. yeah. So I talked to this guy, and it was like really tough because the guy's not very good in English, and I obviously am not good in Japanese. But we managed to um, reach an agreement usually through monetary, uh, you know, contract of him sending me the book, uh, JoJo6251. And then I ordered this from Amazon, the second half, which is a JoJo art book, the one that came out in 2018, I think. That is all so gorgeous. Yes. Every single character all the way leading up to part eight. Jesus. That's correct. And part eight just finished as well. Yep. Will is like, he's like... Just, just look. No, because I remember reading and watching all these parts. It's, it's just really cool just to see it in raw form. Yeah, and there's like exclusive stuff in each one too. So they, I think they even have okay, the. I Louvre. really love the art for part five and part six as well. I think they even have like the Louvre exhibition in there in the second half in the in the the, the, the my second gift. So it's all there. It is pretty much as any JoJo fan would want. Yeah, they have all the Gucci stuff here as well. Exactly. So. There you go, buddy. All the way from Paris through to Florence, Sendai, Osaka, and then Nagasaki, Kanazawa. Holy crap. Happy birthday, Will. This is fucking awesome. Yep. There you go. Now, just full disclaimer, I, I don't actually collect a lot of art books. Uh, the only one I have is actually from Tokyo Ghoul. So, uh, but everyone already knows how much I love Tokyo Ghoul. So now that everyone knows how much I love JoJo, this is a very fitting thing to add to my collection. Yes. So... Thank you so much, man. Yeah, it's all good, bro. This is awesome. Yep. All right, let's get that this out of the way because now we're going to go to talk more about JoJo and more about Monogatari. Okay, ne- okay. I know when your birthday is. Okay, yeah, it's, it's past. But yes. when the next one comes up, we need to make sure that we find the right. <laughs> it has to be another got to watch them all. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Do you, Do you need to take a break? Figure this out for a bit. We we could just take a no, short no, break. No, let's just go straight into okay, it. Okay, all right. I'm, I'm super happy, but like the show must go on as well. Absolutely, and the show will go on because right now we should talk about JoJo Part Two, also known as Battle Tendency. Now, Will has stated, and I have stated that it is episode ten to twenty six of uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Season One because there were multiple remakes and so on and so forth. 
but that's the one that we are going to talk about. Yeah. So just like with Phantom Blood, Battle Tendency had been serialized many, many, many years ago, like way before I was born. I think just around the time you were born, actually. Uh, um, yeah, actually, it started on November 2nd, 1987, just 10 days before my birthday. Right. So there, yeah, therefore, like JoJo existed like around the same time you existed and so and i'm jason it's, it's actually quite fitting that this is around the time that you started watching jojo's bizarre adventure as well um specifically part two so it came out in 1987 through to 1989 but it took many many years almost like two decades plus to get the second part adapted in anime form uh, now there were OVAs for like the first part of Phantom Blood, um, but those were like, done a long, long time ago. I think they were also done by Deeper Production, but then now, fully like, in HD, in color, every single episode of JoJo is now adapted, and it's because of the fact that the, serial, the, the, the source material existed for so long that it was easy for the production studio to be as faithful as possible. And faithful they have. So I have watched specifically. Uh, the 17 episodes, and therefore I am done with season one, which will then, our next journey, the next leg of our journey with me going through uh, Stardust Crusaders. Yeah, Stardust Crusaders, which is um, part three, but it is one of the chunkiest ones. It is, it, at least for the anime, 48 episodes, which is pretty much double what you've just watched for part one and part two. So how we're going to do this is similar to the first Gotta Watch Them All. Will and I are going to talk about the non-spoilers of each of our leg of our journey. And then we would have like a very short, you know, break that we will splice in that will last several seconds. So everyone will know, okay, this is the spoilery stuff. And then we will talk about the spoilery stuff. So we will make sure that there is ample time before each spoiler section such that if you don't want to know about the monogatari or you don't want to know about the jojo or you don't want to be spoiled of either of them there is a very clear distinct line where you'll be like okay past this point forget it and then furthermore i would put timestamps in the show notes so everyone will know when and where to stop all right yeah so uh should we go into jojo part two first you absolutely wanna... okay so Jojo Part 2 is essentially the continuation of the Jojo bloodline going in from Jonathan Joestar onto the main character of Part 2, which is Joseph Joestar, his son. Um, this is, I think, maybe like two decades after the original series in terms of timeline uh, and is mostly based in the U.S., based in New York, though they do get around the world. Um, very different character styles between Jonathan and Joseph, where Jonathan is very upstanding, proud, defender of you know his, his, his family, his friends, and does anything he can to be able to fight against evil. Joseph is a bit of a delinquent. A little bit of like a, a whippersnapper and a, a trickster, yeah, you know, kind of like ruffian he's, he's, on he's, the he's street. He's not a shithead, but he's just basically like he's more street smart than book smart. Absolutely. Now, after going through all of Battle Tendency, I have come to the realization of two things. The first thing is calling JoJo's adventure, JoJo's bizarre adventure, is in my mind the most accurate descriptor of this whole series e even if though i haven't consumed any of the future ones but i will it is the most appropriate description it's just calling it bizarre it's not calling it weird because for many people that sounds like the same thing but i always attribute weird to something a bit more negative a bit more antisocial a bit like out of the ordinary in a bad sense i, I for me it's like it's 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 not so it, it, exactly like you said in words like a little bit out of the ordinary but it's not like so strange it's like oh it's raining today oh that's weird i thought it was going to be sunny it's like you wouldn't say it's bizarre bizarre is more of like the more extreme end of weirdness of oh, strangeness for me it's it, it's hailing in the middle of summer that's yeah. That's fucking bizarre, Will. Yeah. Rather than saying, oh, that's weird. I would say bizarre is more definitive, more wow. formal. So someone who was in the top of our class is actually flunking out of school. That's extremely bizarre. He's always been a grade A student. He's always been a grade A student. Like, that was when I would say bizarre, where it's like, oh, that person who usually is first is now second. Oh, that's weird. Like, it, there's, there is like a scale between the difference of weird and bizarre. For me, I, I completely agree with Jason that there are certain contexts that you would use either word. So and Jojo is not it's not Jojo's weird 
adventure. It's so I, for sure bizarre. I knew how, you know, crazy Jojo was either through osmosis, through, you know, just the internet or through Will. Yeah, or- memes, YouTube, like Jojo fans, especially the, the, the worst of Jojo fans, the really toxic ones. And I consumed part one. So I knew a little bit in terms of the context and of how weird it can be. But boy, bro, mm, was I surprised. Now, before I get into that, my thoughts, I need to sort of alert everyone who is going on this journey with me. First of all, thank you for coming along the ride with us. Now, the mindset that you need to be when you watch JoJo's Bizarre Adventure of any part, I think, especially going forward, because Will says it gets even crazier, is not to think too much about the intricacies and details of the series. I think that that may not necessarily be the most like outlandish thing to say about you know a fictional medium, but you know in a in a in a world you know like where anime and manga exists or live action stuff exists, a lot of people like to pick apart certain plot holes, uh, certain things in that are inconsistent. And use it to be like, well, this show is not as good because it wasn't really thought out. Because I could easily like thwart like this horror villain if I just did X, Y, and Z, which is perfectly fair to have. But I think if you really want to to understand JoJo at its core, you need to put logic and reasoning out the window because it serves no benefit to anyone. I think, for example. Here's a very, uh, very simple, superficial thing, which is similar to like 007, for example, you know, like Golden Eye and, you know, James Bond stuff. They travel all around the world, but they don't really explain like how they got there, the logistics, the, the booking of flights or just the traveling time, how everything happens so fast or not at all or no effort. Like, don't think about it, guys. Like, like normal real life shit does not apply to the world of JoJo. More so than just your usual stuff. So it is doing everyone a disservice by assuming things are realistic. To be fair, though, it's like we're still talking about anime and, and, and fiction and fantasy, right? So, of course, it's like it's easy to say, oh, like, don't don't think too much about it. Don't think like that you, you have to apply. Like, it's, it's one of those shows where like, yeah, just turn off your logical brain and just accept whatever you see on screen. Because the more you try and think about it, the more you're actually straying away from the purpose of JoJo. Now, everything that I said from part one, which is very positive, is transferred over to part two. And I believe that it would transfer over to pretty much everything going forward. Also, though, the amount of hilarity, uh, bombasticness, fabulousness, dazzling, I would also say, and the straight-up homoerotic elements of what people would associate with JoJo has been exhibited more so in part two than in part one. Now, Will has told me off mic that, well, guess what? All that stuff you just said is, first of all, accurate, but then it gets even better in all the later parts. Would you say so? In the first season, the first part, Phantom Blood, there was only one notable female character, right? And then you go into part two, Battle Tendency, and there are only... There's there's still one notable female character, but there are two in total. Oh God, are you saying in part three there would be two notable female characters, but three female characters in total? I think so. Oh my God, I think so. It's a simple formula, right? But the thing is, it's like it's it's not like oh this is like some purely giga chad fucking like forty like four twenty smooth brain like three hundred sixty no scope IQ shit like no it's it the thing is like you're just meant to enjoy it at face value and whatever you see on screen you either choose to like it or you don't like it and for the most part the people that I know that have consumed it do like it and yeah. I like it quite a lot. Um, I I love it, but that's because I have a personal like affinity to it, right? Especially like with Jason coming in and like, experiencing it firsthand now. Like the enjoyment, of course, has to grow over time. This is not this, this is like a slow journey. This is not like you have to love JoJo immediately. No, this is not the purpose of doing this series, right? Um, as I was telling uh, Will before uh, we resumed recording the podcast, I would say currently, currently. I'm not a fan of JoJo, but I am definitely an appreciator of JoJo. But I can see myself veering towards the fan category. 
and I'm happily, happily ready to accept that fate. Like it may, it may not be, it may never be like a top ten for you. But it's like when you see the memes, when you hear the JoJo talk, when you see little snippets on YouTube, you're like, "Yep, I remember watching that part. That part was awesome." I mean, there was already like more than several parts in part two, specifically that I was like, "That's that meme. That's that meme. That's that meme." And just, it's just like, "Oh, I see." Or even better, um, here's a funny thing that is not necessarily a spoiler. So I play a lot of fighting games. Um, a very well-known fighting game that I play is uh, Street Fighter Four, and my main character that I, I, I use. I personally think the best of the Street Fighters, actually, uh, it, 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 unless you talk about Street Fighter Two Turbo. But at least the modern ones, Street Fighter Four is it. So Rose is a very uh, well-known fighting game character within the lore of Street Fighter, and is my main character that I play as. And I did not know this, but it actually was based off of a character that shows up very prominently in Part Two of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. Yeah, a lot of detail and references were taken from that character. So, I mean, hey, everything's a Jojo's reference. And that's the other thing too was like I was saying to Will like, "Oh, this character looks exactly like, you know, that Street like, Fighter." Like Rose from Street Fighter, yeah. And then you were like, "Yeah, because it is." And I was like, "What?" And, and then boom, a paragraph of exactly who that character is and where they drew inspiration from. But I have to say though, one thing that I so far don't really like about Part 2, which has also in been in part one so far is the women the role of women in this uh part i think for example there are certain characters that um transition from part one to part two because obviously that they're still there and there was a grandma for example i thought the grandma in part two was very very badass and just she doesn't have a lot of screen time but she was like dope like her demeanor the way that she carries herself was just fantastic and then Throughout that time, there's also another character, which is the Rose character, which I'll just say now is called Lisa Lisa. I don't think that's really a spoiler. Her character is also like pretty well done in terms of the design, her demeanor, her tone, the way that she carries herself. As far as like JoJo character entrances, it's one of the strongest ones. But And also, like you know. it was one of the female characters that I thought was going to make a big impact in terms of the storyline of jojo part two in terms of the action stuff and there is a bit of that but what ends up happening was not what i thought in the negative sense and i thought that she got done really dirty in terms of the storyline part i think there's also the third female character that's very minor but her relevance to the characters especially the main character joseph joestar is actually quite significant that I did not see coming. It was never really alluded to in the beginning. It was maybe a bit foreshadowed, but then it's just like all of a sudden it's like, boom, that character, super important now. And I'm just like, okay, fine. All right. But like there was no development. There was no, there was a little bit of a hint, but it's not really there for me. And then the one with the opposite stuff had a lot of screen time, had a lot of emphasis, ends up kind of falling flat in my opinion. I would say that in terms of the character choices, I don't think it was like a deliberate choice that Araki, the mangaka for JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, chose to like overshadow female characters and put more spotlight on male characters. I think this is in the end, like the source material that he drew from, like Roman Empire gladiators and wrestlers, looking into like JoJo's like, like body style, like for sure it's like influenced by like Rambo and Terminator. Um, and those references there, there, are there's, there. There's a lot of characters that like Guile from Street Fighter, right? Like I think the thing is, it's like it, it it's he was making do with what source material he had, and he didn't necessarily want to underrepresent women. It's just that what material he had gave him like the palette to essentially go about and draw characters a certain way. And it's like, well, this is the male character here. We will just create more male characters. I think that's that's just something that like we're not gonna you know shy away from. There, it, it is a, a male character dominated series, and, and like I feel that with a lot of shonens. That tends to be the case, too. Yeah, I want to emphasize that I'm not saying that it is sexist or any of that. No. But I am saying that it is you underutilized. Would, you would have liked more, right? It would have been, It probably would have added like, another like, side to JoJo that could be further appreciated. Yeah, because you're right. Like, 80 to 90% of the cast is male. So when there is a I female... I would say more than that. Like, yeah, 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 probably, yeah. It's like 95% men. So then when a female shows up, 
you're like, okay, that's, you know, rare in terms of the cast of characters proportion wise. So what is this character going to show me? What is this character going to do? And I have to say, at least in that department so far, I have been not very happy or a little bit disappointed by does not necessarily mean that like, oh, therefore, you know, Jojo is sexist. No, it's just like, man, it would have been cool if all of them were awesome. That's it. So that's how I feel about the women character. I think the other thing I have to say that carries over from part one is the exposition and monologues. I think that this show is basically going to continue that trend of having someone there at the scene at that point dictating everything or explaining stuff. You know that kind of anime trope of like, oh, they're playing, for example, you know, Kuroko no Basket, for example. They would have a, a basketball game. But then all of a sudden, this guy does this crazy move. And then they're like, oh, how do they do that? And then all of a sudden, like, a character on the sidelines is like, oh, is it because of X, Y, and Z? Or like this, this, and that. And if you don't like that, I have to tell you right now, I don't think you will like JoJo. If you are bothered by that inconsistency in which a person would monologue for like a minute explaining certain things when everything should be happening around them, but time just stops, you are not going to like JoJo and you're just not going to like anime, a lot of it, a lot of anime in general. Because I think JoJo Part 2 carries on that old schoolness because the source is very old school. The source was made in 1987 to 1989. So you would expect a lot of, you know, very burly Rambo, Terminator, like Giga Chad in a way, right? But also a lot of gentleman-like qualities, a lot of old school exposition and monologue that you will not really get that much of nowadays. And really? I, th- I, I, I actually disagree. I think you, with, you see a lot of, and it's, if it's done in the form of a monologue, it's done in the form of a, of a flashback. Yes, I like, think I think flashbacks don't count. But that, but it it follows the same formula of explaining what's happening in the story through another medium, and so therefore it's like you're just seeing the same thing, but just in a different form. Oh no, absolutely, will. Uh, but the thing is that, as like, a, an asshole critic, someone would say like, oh, this person is monologuing on the spot. Whereas the flashback isn't technically... that what like most of monogatari is as well. Absolutely, I'm not saying like that's a bad thing. I mean, or you're making thing. it sound like it's a bad thing though, because you're saying that like if you don't enjoy this, and like they're like criminal of doing this, then like you're not gonna like enjoying it, watching it. But it's like if every other anime does that too, then like is there a specific point to bring it up? Because if every other anime does also have like extended monologues or flashback scenes that basically explain what's happening in the story then that just means that every anime is criminal of doing the same thing you're talking about right now. And therefore, I said earlier, you won't like anime, period. Right. That's why. I would say you won't like JoJo and you won't like anime. Right. Because that's exactly what it is. Because to me, it's more apparent than your typical flashback or typical monologue. Because really, a lot of the battles are very short in terms of real time length, so to speak. So then with like animes like Initial D, right, Will? So... Initial D, the, the races are very short in length, but they actually spend a lot of episode time to explain the actions and the motivations of these people. I think that's a very important part of anime and, and manga that are not that apparent in live action or other mediums. That if you don't like that, then, bro, like, don't. I mean, there's always going to be, like, a shonen or, any, or actually any anime where it's like, wait a minute, they're doing that move? There's no way unless, and then they go masaka, and then they'll just like flashback or like go into like a long monologue of what exactly is happening on the screen. And I I I, I get that, and I that's get, the I benefit. Get that, I get that like JoJo does kind of maybe take it to the extreme, but like, I think that's one of the the benefits of anime and manga is that they can quote unquote freeze time and show you the context, show you the flashback. But I just feel it that does feel a little more out of place here to do it here to do it in like live action, I suppose. A hundred percent. So, the other thing that I will say though, Will, is uh, you said masaka, right? If I had a shot of whiskey every time someone says nani, or or not even like the word nani, but they go like nani, uh, I think I would die of alcohol poisoning. You would probably, yeah, you would black out, and I would have to find you in the hospital. No, you wouldn't. You would bury you, me six <laughs> feet under. You would be you like, already die on the scene. Like okay. yeah, a game over. So, I think a lot of bombastic nature. I mean, I went on for a long for the monologue and exposition, but I 
what I will eventually say before we get into spoilers is this show is great. This show is accentuates a lot of the distinguishing characteristics that are present in part one, but put it like one notch or a couple of notches higher. And from what I can tell, if you are going to commit to that, first of all, you're doing very well, Jojo, committing to this. You pick the right things to commit to, but then I'm ready for the next one. I'm ready to dial this up to to 11. I'm ready to dial this up to 20. I'm ready to go past the time continuum, bro. Of course, like there are going to be like some of the the things that people don't like about the Jojo series. It's still fairly consistent. Like you can definitely see. Like I mean, I I didn't enjoy watching part one, like uh, Battle Tendency or Phantom Blood. Though I did like Battle Tendency more. I in the end, I think I gave, I gave both, and I might have given Phantom Blood a seven, and then I gave uh, Battle Tendency an eight. But in the end, it's like it was still very much the start of the journey. Like you're only like two curves into the whole world of jojo and it's it's been a good start right absolutely i think that part two is better than part one as well i would give all of season one an eight out of ten but really it's a 7.5 because as will uh said part one is not as good as part two it's nothing to do with the episode length it's just i don't think it's that good and it evens out to a 7.5 but i think it's more eight than seven the last thing i would say though is uh the time period in which uh, Jojo Part 2 takes place. Let's say there are a certain country that has uh, waged war on the world. And there are certain characters that basically are alluded to be this... I mean, we can just say it, right, Will? Nazis. Nazis. So, look, (laughs) there's going to be German Nazis in uh, a time period of Jojo where World War II is happening. So... If you don't like Nazis, first of all, well, no one does. Here's the thing, right? Like, I don't think there are, unless you're a sympathizer. Um, In which case, please don't listen to our podcast. I don't really. I, I'd be really, really like shocked if there was a Nazi sympathizer that actually listened to the Good Anime Palette podcast. But, like, okay, there are going to be Nazis and, like, thematic things that, like, probably don't sit too well with most people. But, like, really, really just take it with a grain of salt. It does not go that deep into the mindset and the history of what it means to be a Nazi. It's just for character purposes. And also they don't take themselves seriously at all. At it's still all. as bizarre as it's just, you have a bizarre Jojo character who happens to be a Nazi. That's, that's basically it. And to be fair, that character I thought was done. Okay. Uh, and I was surprised. I, I, know, I know when you texted me, you're just like, I can't believe I'm actually feeling okay about a Nazi character in JoJo. I'm like, I know who the fuck you're talking about. I feel the same way, but that's not talking about him being a Nazi. It's just talking about him being a JoJo character. And I will go into that when we get into spoilers. Yeah. All right, so... We spent uh, a bit of time going into the JoJo stuff, but JoJo's great. It, it's it's definitely like one of my favorite series. Um, and now it's going on to oh, oh, sorry, my sorry. side. One last thing. The music is fantastic but very bass dubstep like than i thought the, it would the be. soundtrack itself as opposed to like the, the opening uh music like there are a lot of segments where they definitely go through like bass line drum beats a little kind of like synth wobbles throughout uh the different character introductions particularly when you have a, sp- a particular set of men show up i mean i know it's a lot yes. of men throughout jojo but you will know which ones i'm talking about but the soundtrack is great but i I was just surprised, pleasantly surprised, at the way that the music was orchestrated, and I would listen to the soundtrack. Okay. Now on to Kizu Monogatari, which is part of the Monogatari series that Jason also loves, and I'm starting to grow into as well. So I watched Baki Monogatari the first time, covers five different characters, well, ma- main characters, because there's five different arcs. Uh, this one is one whole damn arc itself, because it's one basically one novel but split over three movies so there's part one teketsu part two neketsu and part three reiketsu uh now the english translations are iron-blooded hot-blooded and cold-blooded um as i mentioned in the first part it roughly comes up to around an hour each for each movie except for part three which is an hour and 20-ish minutes um the, 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 the movie is great it focuses specifically on I think there's really big main like four main characters and then there's like adversaries that come up in it as well. So 
you still have uh, the main protagonist, which is uh, Koyomi Araraki. Uh, and then you have uh, Tsubasa Hanakawa, uh, who is the cat in the first part. Uh, and she has a pretty, pretty like strong influence in the Kizu movie series. But the main one, the main focus of this whole series, this whole movie series, uh, that has like a very small part in the first part, is Kiss Shot Azurola Orion Heart Underblade. Oh my god, you went through the whole name. Also oh. known as Shinobu. Uh, yeah. She's voiced by one of my favorite female like VAs of all time, by Sakamoto. I fucking love you. Uh, and I, it was just awesome to see that, like, because anytime you talk about Jojo, uh, not Jojo, you talk about like the Monogatari series and you talk about like best girls or people buy like uh, figures from the Monogatari series. Shinobu is consistently one of like the top three. They're all, she's, there's always going to be like people who say that their best girl or waifu, however you want to call it, is Shinobu from the Monogatari series. But she didn't have much of a presence in the first part. In- Second part, on the other hand, she is the main damn thing. So Kizu Monogatari is the second novel in terms of uh, the Monogatari series light novel written by Nishio. But the movies were released way after most of the anime series had come out. Exactly. Just because of production hell and all that. So uh, I feel the need to go, sort of give everyone a bit of background info. So as Will mentioned, Kizu Monogatari consists of a trilogy of movies, uh, Iron-Blooded, Hot-Blooded, and Cold-Blooded. It talks about the Kizu Monogatari, which in um, the Monogatari naming convention, Kizu means uh, injury. Or tragedy, and in this case, it I'd say it's basically the main thing. Like, yes. like the main plot within the first part, especially when you see it, is literally a litany of different injuries, and then it just ends right there. And then you go into the second part, which is more injuries, and then in the third part, it's not, it's no longer physical injuries; it's emotional injuries, mental injuries. Just there's. Just a lot of hurt and pain throughout all three parts of every Kizugonagatri movie. And I'll just say it. What a beautiful movie. So there's there there are certain parts, of course, with like as we talked about before, 3D animation isn't exactly the greatest, but it's it's done in such short form that you just kind of just gloss over it. You focus on other things. Um, the fight scenes are some of the best I've seen in any anime, and I'm also including any of the stuff that Yupo Table has done. So props to you guys, Shaft. You guys are fucking good at what you guys do. And the character developments and the stories, are, again, Monogatari itself means story. And just as much as JoJo is focused on the bizarre, Monogatari is very much focused on like the whole Monogatari thing as well. It's It's just basically... Like the extreme of storytelling, and it does it in such a beautiful way to the point where, the, like I've said, there's only really like four main characters, and each character has like an equal amount of dialogue, monologue, and just like Jason said, if you if it's not what you like, then you will absolutely not enjoy the Monogatari's. I thought that I was not that down with it because of the amount of dialogue in the Baki Monogatari series, but once you start actually getting into it, once you start learning more about why there's these long expositions, why these characters need to go on drawn out monologues, you then find that this is the reason why Monogatari is so good, because it is a light novel series to begin with. So storytelling has to be its forte, and it is the, the strongest point. Despite having all these crazy animations, fight sequences, and beautiful character designs, the storytelling itself is top-notch, and it receives everything else. Before you see the wonderful color palettes, the compositions of all the different character fighting choreographies, the storytelling takes precedent before everything else, and that's something that I've learned to like appreciate and really enjoy during my monogatari adventure so with kizu monogatari even though it's the second book in the monogatari series it is actually a prequel that takes place chronologically before baki monogatari uh furthermore it introduces very very prominently as will mentioned shinobu known as heart under blade i'm just gonna say heart under blade rather than the full name that's just crazy uh, but commendable that you went through the full name at least once and uh, the VA for uh, Shinobu, I think, is fantastic because uh, 
uh, Shinobu goes through certain transformations and her voice changes even though it's the same VA and she goes it's, it's just fantastic the other thing that I want to mention as we alluded to several times already is that it went through development hell yep. and- so as of like 2011 in September it was slated to have been released in 2012 but then in April of that year 2012 uh, the release date was pushed back then in 2015 October uh, they were ready to release the first film and they essentially announced the date to be January 8th, 2016. So they finally managed to get the first movie out all the way through to the third film, which was then premiered in April 7th of 2017 in the United States. It then premiered in Hong Kong a month later. So the development hell was pretty rough for most people because whilst every other series within the Monogatari like, novel line was actually coming out so we're talking like nisei we're talking about like the the neko blacks uh, and we're talking about all the other things kizu had taken its sweet time to be refined to be redone and then to finally be released five years after the initial announcement and i have to say if you were to watch kizu monogatari during that time right you can actually see why it took so long because the look and the aesthetics and the even the color palette is completely different than the rest of the Monogatari series. And it is just balls to the wall crazy the amount of art slash animation quality such that if you were like, oh, this took six years, I'll be like, yeah, it makes sense. Man. We, we should pour one out or press F for the real time fans who had to wait those long five years before you got to watch the Kizu Monogatari movie because it basically threw out your watching order out of sync. And finally, you know, five years later, you got to enjoy everything in the order that Nishio Isin wanted everyone to consume it. So if you remember the first several minutes of Bakemonogatari, maybe the first half of the first episode of Bakemonogatari, there was these quick splices of certain events that when you were to see that for the first time, you would not understand like what's going on. And then I told you that, hey, Will, that's actually Kizu Monogatari. And you're like, what? And then now that you have seen Kizu Monogatari, you should go back to watch those scenes and you will discover the difference of quality and look. But they're talking about the exact same events. And it's just crazy. The last thing I would say before I would uh, jump it back to you is Shinobu is probably my favorite character of the Monogatari series, bar none. Does that mean that I don't like my waifu Senju Gahara? Absolutely not. I love Senju Gahara way more. But the relationship between Araragi and Shinobu is, in my opinion, the most important thing, most impactful thing, and the most beautiful thing in Monogatari series, bar none. I mean, with with, with the amount of cast there is, with the amount of characters within the Monogatari series, it's, it's, it is very hard to pick up like one titular character or one main waifu main best girl that encapsulates all of monogatari um just as is the limited amount of characters that there are at least i've seen so far from Bakemonogatari monogatari through to nisei monogatari but it's been consistent that whenever there are at least top three girls it's always been senshukahara hanakawa and shinobu not necessarily in that order. Yeah, never in that order. Because, I mean, like, I, I thought I really liked Senshikahara. I thought I uh, amazingly loved Hanakawa. But then Shinobu, on the other hand, is like... She entered the scene. Ooh. I mean, you like, challenge your approaches. Like, entering the scene, no. This is more just like, hey, like, you thought you were watching Monogatari? No, I am Monogatari. Welcome to the show, bitch. Like, this is, like, her moment to shine. And shine she did. Like... I mean, that, that's the whole point in watching Kizu. Like, Kizu is, like, her, she is, like, the main character of Focus. And it was just enjoyable all three and a half hours. Like, I just, I fucking loved the movies. I think I gave all the movies three, uh, uh, all three movies nines. I may have even given, like, part three a ten. I need to check my scale. But it, for sure, it's, like, you, you will not, like, miss a beat. You will, like, absolutely enjoy every single minute of watching the three movies of Kizu Monogatari. Now... After Kizu Monogatari, the next series in the watch order is Nisei Monogatari. 
uh, now as Jason has very kindly put together. As always, it's a portmanteau of Nise Mono, which means a counterfeit, copy, duplicate, and monogatri, which is like a tail. So definitely then it's like an imitation tail, a fabrication tail. And it very much like encapsulates what that particular series within monogatri stands out to be. Um, now, as the third part in the series, it is actually in adaptation order, the second from Studio Shaft. So it came out uh, right after the Bonaga- uh, Bake Monogatri series. Um, and I... Um... Okay, okay, all right. <sighs> so Nisei Monogatari, when it comes to the, the, the fandom of Monogatari series, you will probably find universally that everyone either does not like Nisei Monogatari or they just outright hate it. But I would argue that 100% of them would be like, but you got to watch it because it actually is quite important and there's a bunch of characters that are introduced and then it becomes way more important later on. So you got to watch it because it's part of it and it sucks, but it's not that great. It's really weird. It's also kind of horny, but you know. Well, kind of. I'm, 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 I'm being very uh, diplomatic here. Yeah, I mean, like... If you are up you, to, I, mean, I appreciate you trying to defend it, but oh, let's, I'm not let's, defending it. Let's, let's be real; it goes beyond just a little bit of edgy. It, it goes beyond just a little bit of culture. It is some of the uh, horniest shit you'll see in any anime. Really, uh, there is a very infamous scene. I think in episode eight, I think that involves a toothbrush. If you are up to date with your anime memes... It's it's not Damachi, by the way. It's not the dungeon uh, isekai or whatever the one that was with the two people doing the toothbrush dancing. Oh, no, no. That, it's, that, that, that's, that, that's, that's, that's That's not the, the infamous one. That's the famous one. Yeah. The infamous one, on the other hand, takes part with the Nisimogatari. And, um, yeah. So, tasteful, uh, right? Very tasteful. Ugh. I, I, I gagged in my mouth. But it, it was very uncomfortable. We, we, we will have a bit of a spoiler section later on, which we'll go into in more depth. But the general consensus is, and I agree with it as well, that this is not necessarily the most important part of the Monogatari series. In fact, I would say that if you were to skip it, uh, and I think some people have, right? It's it's not like the worst thing you can too. However, it's still something that was written by Nishio Isin. And if you are the creator of this series that is so beloved by so many people, you're not going to give a shit, right? You're going to be like, well, this is still like the story that I want to tell within Monogatari. You are going to consume it. And because there's also elements that will then bleed into the future episodes, the future series of Monogatari, you should still watch it. And, you know, I, I watch it. There, there, there's definitely things you can enjoy about Nisa Monogatari. Now, it's just that the criticisms afterwards, like, kind of outweigh it. I don't hate the series, but there are certain things i saw which i wish i didn't see i i also agree with that statement but if you were to ever not watch nisei monogatari i would understand but if you absolutely don't want to watch it the as Bok- bake monogatari split into several arcs nisei monogatari is as well with uh the first seven episodes being karen b and the last four episodes being tsukihi phoenix which takes place um was not takes place, which features the Aragi sisters. They're, uh, and one sister is the first seven episodes, and the second sister is the last four episodes. I yeah. would say that if you have to, if you have to, which I don't think you should, but if you have to, watch the last four episodes. That's way more important than the first seven. Yeah. Or if you want to go full completionist of the Monogatari series, just watch it. Yeah, it's, just, it's not. It's not. It, okay, it's definitely not the worst thing you can watch. It's not even worse or bad in general. It's just that there are certain things that will maybe turn your attention away from the monogatri, from Nisei Monogatari. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it's also like we kind of glossed over these two characters in the Baki Monogatari series because we do know that Araragi, um has two younger siblings, Karen Araragi and Sukihi Araragi. Um, now they have a very bit part role within Baki Monogatari, non existent in Nisei Monogatari, but then when you get into Nisei, it's full on Araragi sisters and that it, yeah, if you want to know more about them, this is it. I also feel that uh as Will mentioned, there is a there's a lot of decent and or even good moments in Nisei Monogatari. I think the 
dialogue, the very long dialogue between Araragi the and... The whippersnapper kind of, like, comeback comedy, um, like, kind of, like, derogatory of, like, making fun of each other. Like, it, there is still that, and yeah. like, you can definitely appreciate that. There's but, just some more cultured elements in there that we'll go over later. And nothing that encompasses one of the very well-known scenes between Shinobu and Araragi. So we will get into that in spoilers. Uh, the last thing that I would say is Nisei Monogatari has a new character that's called that's introduced. And it is not a, a female, but a dude. And I have to say that this dude, I did not like this guy at all. Uh during Nisei and and a little bit further on. But I would agree with a lot of people that this character is not only his importance becomes even greater later on, but is probably one of the best characters uh, in all of Monogatari. And I really like this character a lot. But when I was watching Nisei, I was like, the fuck is this? This is bullshit. This guy is like terrible. So I would say that Nisei Monogatari... I watched it. It's not great. It's the weakest. But to be honest, I still think it's good in the grand scheme of things. But when you compare it to the rest of the Monogatari series, yes, Nisei is the worst. But when you say comparatively to anime in general, I would say Nisei is still okay. Minus the really questionable stuff, which I think Will and I will get into in spoilers. Anything you want to uh, end the... No, I think we can then move on to the one of the most important things about uh, anime, at least something that I've slowly started to pick up because I, I'm a criminal of not really caring about uh, openings uh, for anime. Oh, but right, right, right. I yeah. think we can go into that now. Um, okay. So, Kizu Monogatari, I mean, there really isn't all that much of an OP. I think the music in general is like fantastic, but there's other things I would like to say is more of a focus in Kizu, but in Nisei. Uh, just like in Bak- Bakemonogatari, there are multiple openings. Three in this one, actually, because, I mean, with uh, Bakemonogatari being longer and having more characters of focus, there was going to be more uh, openings. So there, there were five openings in Bakemonogatari. Nisei, there are three. Um, so in order, uh, at least you know when they first came out, but they feature in uh, different episodes. So the first opening is uh, Futaku Tome, uh, which is sung by... Uh, the character of uh, Senju Kahara, um, the voice actress being Chiwa Saito. The second one is Marshmallow Justice, sung by the character Karen Araragi, uh, who is voiced by Eri Kitamura. And then the last one, the third one, is Haken Disco, also known as Platinum Disco, by Skihi Araragi, uh, voiced by Yuka Iguchi. So if we were to do an opening order at the very bottom of that list, and again, by very bottom, I mean there's only three to choose from, so there's got to be one that's at the third, second, and first place. I have to put Futaku Tome as the bottom of the three. And the reason why is because if if you watched Bakemonogatari and you listened to Staple Stable, the, 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 the opening is exactly the same. It sounds almost exactly the same. The lyrics are different, but it sounds... Like like for like the chord progressions, the opening, the the the, the actual like major it it's in, there's almost no difference whatsoever. Well, uh, you made the same mistake with episode twenty. Got to watch them all. One, you said staple staple. It's the other way around. It's stable staple. I I don't care. <laughs> I never really cared about that song anyway. Um, I think I gave. I, I think I put it third in my Pokemon Country opening uh ranking as well. Um, so. Quite apt that it also is third in this list. The second, I, w- I mean, w- w- what would your order be? Actually? Like, how would you have ranked the three OPs for Platinum Disco you know? is number one. Yeah, it, that's it for me. Like Marshmallow Justice is number two. Platinum Disco is, is the best of the three. It's 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 fucking moe as shit. It's... I, I I would not even say uh, the other two OPs are even close. Like it's I would even. Exclude them from the list. I would like just a little say, dance that Sugi does in the beginning with like the little tutting of her arms, and then afterwards, like just just the the incredible quietness of the lyrics. It's it's so good. I absolutely love it. Yeah, that's why Platinum Disco is the how, best. How would I have ranked it in terms of in comparison to the Bakemonogatari series um, music? 
I will probably put it top three so far, but at the moment, I haven't really put everything into a list. So as this series develops, I will actually have like an official like halfway mark ranking oh. of the openings. And then at the end of the Monogatari series, I will give like the official top five, maybe even top ten uh, of openings. Will, I, I have to apologize profusely because I did a quick Google search and uh, I was right. Even though grammatically it's not right. It is staple, staple, yeah. not staple, staple. So um, I made a big fool of myself. There we go. That's why when I saw it, I was always like, nah, that's not it. It should be staple, staple. And no, it doesn't make sense. But in the world of Monogatari, what does, right? Um, so those were the rankings of the three openings. None of them are bad. It's just in the end that like I really, really much prefer Platinum Disco. And rightly so, it's, it's fucking great. Um, I think at some point, maybe in the halfway mark of this long journey, this marathon, we I, will, I will I will have like a, a ranking of the different openings. It's it's for probably, all of them, yeah. Probably more straightforward for JoJo. There's not as many. Um, There's only one, and then like in the, for the parts, there may be like a few more to choose from. But like in terms of the amounts of openings for the Monogatari series, there's already eight to choose from from Bake and Nisei. Uh, I will just say that the opening for Phantom Blood is better than the opening for Battle Tendency, but the two of them are not that far apart in terms of, like, raw score, quote-unquote. I, I would absolutely put Phantom Blood's opening far above. It is, like, the JoJo anthem. But at the same time, like, JoJo Part 2, the opening is, is also pretty decent. And then, of course, there's Roundabout for um, the ending. Yeah, but of, that's the ending. Yeah, that, that, yeah, we're not going to do that ranking. But you, you can't. that's also another very meme-worthy classic. Very meme-worthy? It is meme-worthy. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, okay. All right. We're going to take a, not a break, but we're going to give a couple seconds silence because what we're going to talk about now is spoiler territory. Now, of course, we will have these timestamps in the episode, so you can refer back to that. But if you're just listening and not looking into the timestamps, this is the part where you're going to have to either pause and jump forward or choose to listen through because we're going to go over spoiler territory now and for JoJo Part 2 Battle Tendency as well as the Monogatari series for Kizu and Nisei. And we'll do it in that order. So JoJo first, then Kizu, then Nisei. Okay? Right. All right. Yo, Will, that chariot race in Battle Tendency is fucked up, bro. I was waiting for you to tell me about that part because you were like constantly saying, like, wow, that guy just got stripped in half and he's still talking. Oh, okay. No, there's no, a, no. There's he a didn't Lisa, get stripped in half. There, half his body is gone and he's the still Lisa, talking. There's Lisa, the Lisa Lisa bathtub scene. Okay, right, right, okay. Oh, now they're climbing pillars like covered in lube and that's like their training arc. And then I was like, oh, tell me you're at the chariot scene. Please tell me you're at the chariot scene. And when you told me you're at the chariot scene, I was like, yes, that was my favorite part. In all of Battle Tendency. It was so fucking ridiculous. I like you you have seen these kinds of crazy like wars, crazy crazy races. Like I mean shit, we've watched like we, we, we watched Redline, right? But this is like a completely different thing. And I, it was just balls to the wall, high energy, testosterone, just ridiculous bullshit. It's so stupid. So stupid. Like so stupid like so I, I guess like when you come I, I mean there there always is a ranking within the the Jojo fandom of which Jojo is their favorite now you've only seen two so far right Joseph Joestar from the first part and no no Jonathan Joestar from the first part and Joseph Joestar in the second part between the two Joestars so far like do you have a preference yeah I do right who, who, who's who's at the top right now is it daddy or the son dad I like Jonathan more too. I I mean I think Joseph is a very good character as well. The craftiness and that kind of cocky, uh, manipulative trickster kind of uh, mentality. He is, is he is that he is that like that embodiment of like uber testosterone monkey brain Giga Chad total monkey brain right? But somehow is the main character and somehow is so powerful. Which okay fine like I still think is a very good character. The other characters though. I think Caesar is awesome. I fucking love Caesar. I love William Zeppeli from the first part and Caesar Zeppeli as well from the second part. Um, it's the Zeppeli curse, man. Yeah, man. Uh, Jojo curse as well. Yeah, dude. Like, no matter what, you're always going to have some fucker chasing after you because your bloodline is precious uh, and therefore you need to be eliminated. So um, the followers of uh, Dio Brando, no matter what, they're going to be chasing you down. So, okay, about Dio... You know, from part one, the main villain. Uh, 
he doesn't appear pretty much at all in Battle Tendency. Okay, that's fine. I was really surprised at the importance of vampires in Battle Tendency. Yeah. I thought, like, based off of part one, that, oh, is the vampire is just, like, a thing, and then the other future villains are just going to be, like, variations of, uh, you know, not vampires, basically. But then they go heavy, heavy into this vampire thing. And the best part, or the worst part, is I don't think any blood was really, like, like no woman's or man's neck was like most of the time i think it was like vampires chasing after vulnerable women right and therefore because there was no women in jojo like there was almost no blood sucking no but, but the, there was a lot of like the use of like the sun and uv rays to be able to combat against these um these these vampires um and then of course there's nazi zombies as well yeah so i feel that uh the villains are just crazy the pillar men are just like okay like i because when deal was quote unquote vanquished right i would have thought that okay how are they going to introduce the new villains like oh the stone mask is going to persist right i did not expect it to be an entire fucking pillar and there's three of them and then the masks now have multiplied in terms of infinite and then it's just like, okay, so going forward. And then Speedwagon gets done dirty as well. And then gets not done dirty because then you find out that he's alive. And plot twist, right? Plot twist, yeah. And then uh, Lisa Lisa got done so dirty. I'm so mad at that. I do agree. Okay, so like back when you were talking about like how you were upset that there wasn't enough. I, I wouldn't say female representation, but more the fact that like there weren't as many standout female characters. I, I do get it because as much as it's a show that's focused on male characters, just like with the inverse of Monogatari where the focus of the characters outside of Araragi, outside of Meme Oshino, outside of um, whoever that a character from Nisei was. Um, Kaiki. Kaiki, yeah. It's very much focused on the female characters, right? But well, whereas Nishio does a very good balance that every character has importance, I I do admit that there is underrepresentation of powerful female characters, at least up until this point for the JoJo Bizarre Adventure series. And actually, like, underrepresentation is not necessarily a deal breaker in any context. But my problem with the character Lisa Lisa is she has been made out to be the sensei. She's been made out to be like pretty much so far the sole woman who can use Hamon, which uh is the is like basically chi, right? So then she is made out to be this awesome, powerful woman. Then all of a sudden when it is her time to shine, her time to fight the big bad, she just gets backstabbed and it's just end of story. And like very much quickly, like made to be a damsel in distress, right? Like in the end, like she's the one that needs to be saved, even though like the whole revenge arc of how her husband had been basically compromised and then raised by um the, the by, by the foundation that she's like fighting against, and then she gets outcasted, and therefore she's been plotting her revenge after so many years, only to then be undone by one stab in the back, like. I can I get it, and it's not. It, we're not like trying to be yeah. like, oh, like more rights, more representation for women. Like, if it was a guy, yeah. I would still be like, dude, what the fuck? Yeah. In the end, it's just like the Lisa Lisa character line should definitely have been more fleshed out. Um, it would have been cool. I think in the end, it was just like there's a reason why the first part itself, which includes uh, the battle tendency, was not the most well received. But you could see that it built the foundations of what the other JoJo's built upon that so yeah I, I think like i agree there if if there was a change that it was to be made there would probably be like maybe a, a if, if it was an ova or like a side story or whatnot just to flesh out the lisa lisa black uh, um backstory because like it, it's like from her beginnings of when she did come on because she, there, she actually is a very important character within jojo Right, like she was the girl that was saved by the Jojo family, and then she would basically learned how to use Hamon, and she's like one of the best users of Hamon, and you never really get to see her use it outside of the training arc. It's, it, I agree, it is disappointing. I think the other thing that's rather disappointing is uh, the character Susie Q as well as the ending. So, uh, I, this is spoilers, so we're just gonna say Susie Q comes out of nowhere at the end and becomes from a kind of whatever character to 
potentially a very important character because she went from being the maid of Lisa Lisa to now being the mother of the next Jojo. And that is already like do, where do they reveal the name of the third Jojo? At no, the they end? do not. They don't, so I won't say it. But again. they I, I know it through just memes and just you know, osmosis. and also like the post credits at the end of yes. the Jojo. Uh, and part um two. Joseph does mention when uh they go towards the future at the epilogue, they go like, Oh, I don't get along with my son, and then bam, like minutes later they show his son. So look, I I, I don't understand that, like, she came out of nowhere and then all of a sudden becomes the mother of the next JoJo, which in it my just opinion— seemed, It just seemed too convenient, right? Exactly. And then the last thing I would say is the ending, which is all of a sudden Joseph is supposed to have this death, right? And then they were mourning his loss. Then he just rocks up and was like, yo, guys, what's up with that? I, I get the, the, the whole thing of it is, like, Sometimes things just don't have to make sense, but there also needs to be like a, a proper closure to the series, yeah. and like to be, it, it did feel rushed. I mean, like it, 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 there's no way to look around it. Like even I admit that like the ending for part two is probably the weakest. Yeah, and then they they go through this. Like, if we talk about like the ending of part one, despite like how slow part one was, the ending of part one was really done well. It's very satisfying because you literally see you see tragedy but you also see opportunity you see like a shining light whereas the end of part two is just like oh well that's done right part three next let's go oh it's like oh um this is a 200 page book but we're on page 198 we have two pages left but we have to end this bro okay we'll just have a guy monologue the the you know the the life journey of literally every other character under the sun and then just ex and then just have everyone expect that okay accept it that's fine I whatever mean, it definitely falls under the trope of anime and manga endings done badly like we've seen a lot of those and jojo part two definitely falls in that bracket and the fact that uh suzy q nursed joseph back to you know health i thought was probably the most unbelievable like how did that happen kind of storyline Sure, you can have your uh, suspension of disbelief, but even then it was like the dude was in the middle of an ocean on a crater. How the fuck? But okay, fine. All right. Oh, you didn't tell the rest of your crew, your family that you're alive, but you entrusted your wife to send a telegram and you never thought of, you know, uh, following up on that. Like, okay. Like, I mean, it's not a deal breaker. It isn't. It is just a very anticlimactic end to what is the m most bombastic part the most bizarre part of jojo yet which is obviously there's only been two parts so far so it's not saying that much but it's it, it just felt really blue balled in a way and i felt that like for like 95 percent of it i was on board i was on board with lisa lisa i was on board with everything and then i was like but jo joseph is dead he never had a son, but we all know that the Jojo bloodline continues because, spoiler alert, there's multiple Jojo parts after part two battle tendency. Like, that's not really a spoiler to say, but we include it in the spoiler anyways. Like, I knew something was going to happen. I did not expect it to be that brazen, basically. But that's it. I, I mean, but overall, I still think battle tendency is way better than Phantom Blood. I still think battle tendency is pretty good. And is a very fun ride for sure. It, it's hard to say like that much like bad about it. In the end, like it's still an enjoyable part of JoJo. Um, there's definitely are just some mistakes they made, some things that they could have done better. Um, and hopefully, it, as you watch War of JoJo, they start to pave over those cracks and actually improve the overall enjoyment I enjoyment mean, of it. I mean, when Caesar died and that was got and got up. crushed by a, a, a stone slab. And the stone slab was in a shape of a cross. And then operatic music was playing in the background. And the light was shining through the sun. Because, you know, it's it's metaphorical, Will. I was just like, I was clapping to no one. I was clapping at the screen. Because I was just like, this is JoJo, at least so far, at its finest. At its cheesiest, at its corniest, at its most bizarre. But, bro, you did it. You... You pulled it off. Psych. Awesome. Good time, right? Should we move over to Kizu Monogatari now? Yes. Kizu. Oh, God. Okay. So, 
Um, oh, oh, wait. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We need to pause first. Okay, well, Kizumonogatari is fucking brilliant. Okay, like, when you start off by, like, I mean, like, like you said, right? The opening scene for Kizumonogatari, there's just, like, helicopters flying around. There's Araragi walking in the middle of the city, and all of a sudden, he just bursts into flames. You're like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah, but go- then you think, but then you brought up the fact that like, if you actually think back on like how Bakemonogatari was presented with those little random snippets of like scenes that hey you should know about this, but why haven't you ever seen it before? And then you realize actually there's a lot of interconnection between the two parts because of the prequel sequel connection that they have. It all starts making sense, and I vaguely remember some of the stuff I watched from Bakemonogatari, even though it was several months beforehand. And then seeing Kizu, it's like. Ah, that's what it's supposed to mean. Um, the main thing about Kizu, though, that's very different from uh, Bakemonogatari is that the, the the long exposition, the long monologues don't really happen as much now. And I think the main reason why is because Senju Kahara is not in this part. Yeah, also the look is extremely different. Okay, not- let's, let's talk about looks first okay, okay. of all, right? Okay, before that, before that. Shinobu... Yeah, what a glow up when she becomes like twenty seven. Like she, she has three different ages, right? When she's like eleven, when she's seventeen, when she's twenty seven. Wait, those are the actual age? I think they talk about it in, in the movie. Yeah, I, sure, sure. Yeah, I if I remember correctly, they're, they're, they're basically adolescent, uh, teenager, adult. Um, I thought that Hanekawa was really stacked, and then Shinobu shows up, and I was just like, ah. Okay. Okay. This is yeah. great. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm I'm here for it. Actually, uh, I think there particularly was... in part three of the three movies. Um, Wait, you I know th- exactly what scene I'm talking I, I about. I think there's a there's it's the child. There's the teenager. Then there is like the, the adult one where like she like, where, where you see her in the subway with her arms and legs like completely cut off. No, and she's I dying. think that's like the fourth one because there is her wearing the gloves that are red, and that is the third one. Well, the fourth one, I guess, would be like when she was doing the fight scene at the end, and that's then correct. afterwards when she then loses her powers. There, the, the technical fifth one where she loses her powers, and then like she gets that ultimatum from Meme where it's like, okay, you can either live, but you'll never have your powers back, or you could just die. And it's like, I don't want either of them. It's like, well, then too fucking bad. I, I know we're jumping around, but since we're on that, the kind of compromise that Aragi, uh, Meme, and um, Shinobu does is the most tragic thing ever. It's like you have this whole half hour battle and then Meme comes in and just like, well, nobody gets what they want, right? But at least y'all get something. And everyone's just like, I guess, fine. Okay, I guess I'm going to have to stay a vampire. I guess you're going to have to stay alive, but you have to lose your powers. Like, and then, like, oh, like, but if you do this, then they die. If you don't do this, then they die. It's like, okay, well, what's the next best thing? It's like, okay, why not everyone just be miserable? And, and, uh, that, and that message, because it's Kizu, because it's about injury, it's about tragedy, is very... It's uh, poetic. It's, it's poetic. so it's poetic fun. because it is... The saddest, most fucked up thing, but not in like the bloody way, which will. will. This, the gore and violence in Kizu is. That fight was fucking great. How about when Hanakawa gets disemboweled? It it basically reminded me of like the the batshit craziness of uh, Devilman Crybaby. Yes, because heads start flying and everything, right? And then, of course, like Hanak, I mean, like you would never want Hanakawa to get injured, but at the same time, when she just gets like her gets just completely strewn out, like dude, that was fucked that up. That was that was gnarly. And Ar- really Aragi gnarly. had to like take her guts and literally like push it back into her body. That's like fucked up. Oh, bro. and also the part I think it was at the end of um the second movie when um there it's it's um it's a uh, kiss under kiss underplay where then she's like. Why don't you go grab some snacks? Oh, Rocky. dude. And I was like, okay, sure. Blah, blah, blah. At that point, I was like, you guys are taking a long time talking about what it's like going to be when he no longer needs to be a vampire. He, she gives her power back. She, she gives his powers back. I knew there was going to be something bad. Like it was, just, it, it, You could tell immediately that something was going to hit the fan. I did not expect that he would. she would then go and eat. Is, is it a uh, Dem- uh, demiturgy? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. priest. The yeah. priest where like, she's just basically snacking on his fucking like, disemboweled head. I was like, ooh. Oh, and ooh. then to make matters even worse, uh, Shinobu then tells Aragi, where is that girl that you befriended? Aren't we snacking on her together? And he flips the fuck out. Like, yeah. he... 
he's like you what that you- is that's is one thing that i i don't understand yet but i think that it's done purposefully where like aragi has such close relationships it's like when you know that like oh senju Kahara is the quote-unquote girlfriend but like he also and this leads back into like episode part three where he just like is infatuated with senju Kahara's body um very very infatuated but at Wait, the you same mean time hanakawa is, yeah, 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 yeah yeah hanakawa's body um, but then at the same is very much like pledging allegiance and i guess at times affection for shinobu like this is just a harem uh, series right okay so it's like a faux harem but it's basically been disguised with a bunch of crazy stories and superpowers let's talk about that fondling scene with araragi and oh, it hanakawa done, it was done so tastefully it was the most uncomfortable like seven minutes of my life yes the fondling scene took about seven to eight minutes or ten minutes or whatever it was like he really felt her up like tried to that, in the end, he, he I think in the end they, he just got a, a high five or a handshake or whatever it was. No, uh, no, 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 shoulder no. massage, he, a shoulder massage. He she fondled her though, like like touched her boobs. No, like, he didn't. He, he he tried to. He didn't actually touch it in the end. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Because he was going to, and then she was okay. Uh, but but turn around. But yes. When you yes. turn around, I want you to say the following things, but like in a very sensual Dude, and overexcited so, voice. And I want so you to call bad. me daddy. And she's like, okay, no, daddy. No. Call me senpai, okay? No. Yeah, senpai. And then as he's about to go, he then stops. And then she's like, well, I guess you don't find me attractive then, right? I guess you maybe do all that. You're not following through. I guess you don't, you don't want this body anymore. And she's like, how about I just give you a back massage instead? And she's like, fine. Okay, sure. Fuck it, let's yeah. go. <laughs> Basically, just couldn't get it up. Like that. That's oh, it was. It was. It was as metaphorical as could be. Um, and racy as hell. Very racy. Okay. Ah, oh, God. Okay. But overall, like I, I'd say like if we talked about like a series of movies, um, it, it stands up there at the top. I, I really enjoyed watching Kizu. Um, cannot recommend it anymore. It's, it's just, it's just perfect. A perfect movie. Uh, I think the mixture of violence, aesthetics, animation, quality, uh, character interactions are all fantastic. Uh, perfect lengths as well. It's like if you're used to watching like long series on Netflix or on HBO, it's like th- th- it follows like, the exact same formula, just done in three parts. So it's like very quick and easy to watch. Uh, final shout out to uh, the voice actress though for uh. Heart Under Blade, known as Shinobu, but in Kizu, he's only she's only known as Heart Under Blade. The fact that each time her age jumps by eating uh the her to get her body back, it is all completely different in terms of tone, inclination, voice quality. It, it, it doesn't sound like it is the same person, but somehow she, the voice actress makes it all sound completely different, but also the same person at the same time. I, it's fantastic. I mean, I, I love Maya Sakamoto. She's probably, like, I actually like her more than Hanakawa. Hanakana. Like, I I would say that uh, between the two, I vouch for Maya. Because she voices some of my absolute favorite characters. She's Shiki. She's fucking Shiki from Garden of Sinners. Yeah, man. Right? Like, I, it's 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 hard to, like, look past her. Um, but yeah, uh, I I can't you know give, stack any more praise on Kizu. I've stacked all of it already. Um, very very fun time. Okay, uh, pause for uh, spoilers for Nisei. I fucking don't like Nisei, but not for the reasons that most people. I mean, like story wise, it's fine. Animation wise, it's great. But could they not tone down the amount of? fondling rapiness that there is in Nisei Monogatari. Uh yes. Everyone has that, including myself, have that thought. Because if you were to take all that lewdness out, so to speak, the story doesn't change that much. Or at all. Okay, fine. Uh Kanbaru, she is just naked. But like that's just her nature because she's yeah. perverted. Yeah. But when you're talking about like the sisters and Hachikuji, right? It's just like why, like why? Nanako is also like, I mean, she's oh she, she, she's racy and horny as fuck as well. So, so yeah, the first couple of episodes of Nisei Monogatari is the the weirdest thing to me because it's akin to those like RPGs that like, oh, 
I'm just going to go visit everyone's house and hang out for a bit just to catch up. Oh, do you basically wink, wink, nod, nod to the viewers? Like, remember this character? Remember this character? Remember this character? And I'm just like, yeah. You're you're basically playing a dating sim and you're checking out all the characters which you know you're not going to set your main character with. But you're going to see them anyway because you might want to see some bonus scenes. And bonus scenes you do get. Yes. I will say, though, the opening for Nisei Monogatari I thought was pretty impactful in terms of Araragi being chained down and then Senjukahara showing up. I, I, thought, I miss Senjukahara. I thought that that whole like interaction was great, honestly. But that's like... That's like saying, like, oh, hey, um, this part was great, but I'm ignoring all of this other stuff. And it was also nice to see just a little bit of the break to, from from Hanakawa. I mean, the fact that, like, we've seen so many panty shots and so many, like, boob fondling scenes from Bakemonogatari and Kizumonogatari that it was nice. It was nice change to give her a break and just let her. Uh, I will say one thing, though. I don't like short haired Hanakawa. Oh, okay. Well, spoiler alert, Will, you're not going to like a lot then. Okay. So, uh, I would say, though, in terms of Hanakawa, her interactions with Senju Kahara in Nisei is great. It's a lot more wholesome. Not just that, but, like, Senju Kahara kind of is, like, the sub, and Hanakawa is just, like, lays it on her. Like, bro, let Aragi out now or else. And then you don't know, like, why... But somehow Senjukahara bows down and is like, okay, okay, okay fine, I'll, I'll, I'll let Aragi go. Okay, okay, okay. And you don't know why. But then later on, you find out that uh, Aragi, out of nowhere, before he takes a bath, was like, Hanukkah, what did you say to Senjukahara? And she was like, straight up, she was like, oh, I said to Senjukahara, um, if you uh, don't let Aragi go, I'm going to steal Aragi from you, and sh- he will be my boyfriend. And he was just like, okay, I'm going to go into the bath now. I'm not going to fuck with you ever again. You're scary. Speaking of baths. <laughs> okay, so my favorite scene in Nisei Monogatari is the dialogue between Shinobu and Araragi when he was taking a bath. However, it is the most uncomfortable thing ever, not because of the dialogue, but because what you see or what you don't see. Or, you know what I mean, Will, right? There's just there's just so much wrong with Nisei, but it, can you fault Nishio as well? Like you knew that this was going to happen, and unfortunately, he's bunching everything into Nisei. Like literally, every single episode was at least like one fondle scene or one naked scene. And when naked, it's not exactly like the naked you want to see. I mean, okay, okay, okay. Look, how, how do we how do we explain yeah how, okay? This? So let's let's give some context. This scene involves Araragi taking a bath, and then Shinobu shows up for the first time in Bake slash Nisei in any great capacity, which means that she actually talks to Araragi. You actually hear her speak. I mean, we're we're excluding Kizu, okay? So in this dialogue interaction, they reconcile with each other, and they actually reach a mutual understanding. And not only that, but you start to see the beginning of their twisted kind of love and affection for each other. And I think that it, the dialogue is extremely beautiful. However, aesthetically see, uh, uh, speaking, you get little Shinobu prancing around. Base, it's, she's naked. But she is also an immortal vampire. Oh, yeah. lived for thousands of years. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, that counts. Yeah, Because that's the typical Asian this, uh, this is, anime response, This is response, the very right? thing that people are like, what the fuck is wrong with anime? But, like, I'm I'm not going to apologize for it. Like, I, I don't think anybody needs to. Like, th- it, it's all done for, like, fiction purposes anyway. If you want to take it that far, then you can. It's just, in the end, like, of course, watching it, I did feel uncomfortable, but like, I'm not going to be all of a sudden like, what the fuck is wrong with you, Nishio? Like, no, no, you, I'm not going to do that either, but uh, it's unfortunate for me, at least, that my favorite scene in Nisei is... That um, scene? I have mixed feelings about it, because yeah. the dialogue is really good. No, no, for sure. It's it's absolutely, like, it, it, it bodes well with the Monogatari series in general like you want to have like not just long like monologues but you want to have those character interactions and those are like actually like some of the most memorable parts i mean the, the most memorable parts of bakimonogatari is senju kahara and Araki doing homework and then like her pulling out i think a mechanical pencil or a stapler and putting it towards his mouth again oh like, you're talking to kanbaru yeah oh, why are you calling her kanbaru the fuck 
it's like those are the things that make Monogatari so good. Like, I mean, of course, right? Like, just like how bizarre is the right adjective for JoJo's Bizarre Adventure? Like, storytelling is the absolute modus operandi of the whole Monogatari series, and without it, I think that it it's just a very very lewd harem. Um, but the lewd harem part also is like. It's it's kind of like that that disgusting cherry on the top of the cake, like you know you don't need it, but like when you watch it, you're like, kind of kind of was okay with it, except for maybe when the sisters are involved, the last three four episodes where um, let's just get the toothbrush scene out of the way. Um, shit is fucked up, yo. <sighs> Brush your teeth like for five minutes, and if you don't orgasm, then I win. And then you win. And if you do, then I win. Oh yeah, and I'm seducing you by wearing a skirt for like the only time ever because I am a tomboy. And then also speaking of which, um, I had no idea how tall Karen was. Oh yeah, <laughs> she, she's she's tall, bro. Fucking tall. It's a tall every but than most other characters. Um, and then of course at the end of the toothbrushing competition, she's like. Um, well, um, you know, like, um, since someone came in and interrupted, we can always do a, a second competition. He's yeah, like, dude, like, fuck. What the fuck? What the fuck? <sighs> and then at the end, when the whole, like, Phoenix, uh, what, what, what was the actual, um, part called? Tsukihi Phoenix? Yeah, okay, so, like, the whole Phoenix thing, right? The, the cuckoo thing, where, because it's, like, the whole thing where it's, like, cuckoo birds come in, steal your eggs, and then plant their own eggs, so that's, you know, another bird can raise your child. This is essentially the curse that Tsukihi Araragi has. Um, when she finally awakens at the end, the only way for Araragi to make sure that his sister is, in fact, his sister, oh. is to fondle her, and to try and kiss, kiss her. her. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, I, I can't deny that. Yep, that actually is real, happened in the story, and th- you can't say that that is not the case. Nope. You, we see a lot of this shit in other anime and manga as well. I mean, like, sibling love, first cousin love. Um, yeah. We're, we're not, we're not going to go that far into the I word, but um, it really makes it hard with Nisei, man. Absolutely, 100% <laughs> hard. Okay. The last thing I would ask is about the new characters that get introduced for uh, Monogatari series in Nisei. Specifically, I'm talking about Kaiki, which is the dude, which is kind of like the fraudster. Then you get two women. You get uh, Yozuru, which is uh, hanging out with uh, Ononoki, the doll. What are your thoughts on these three characters real quick? Well, they don't have as much screen time. I think like... Fully, they have around two to three episodes total. Kaiki comes in, comes out. Um, I would like to see their characters fleshed out more because that's the one thing about Monogatari that uh, I'm actually looking forward to. So far, you just see like the main cast over and over and over. Right? You got Kanbaru, Nadako, uh, Miyaki, Senjigahara, uh, Hanakawa, Karen Kihi, Araragi, and Meme. And Shinobu as well. Wow, I just remember all the characters. Um, but then the, the other three uh, that show up in the latter parts of, uh, except for Kaiki, he shows up. I think quite early on, he shows. Um, she he, he shows up for Karen B. Yeah, yeah. But then he's like kind of here and then disappears, which it, it, it bodes well with his character. I think like we'll probably see more of that. Oh, you will. Yeah, you will. So uh, that's what I'm hoping for because. I, the, the I, thing with like with, with Monogatari still is that there like nobody seems to exist in this world outside of the characters that you already know, and each character has so much dialogue that like it makes sense. It's great that like almost each char- each character almost has like the same amount of screen time and discussion time, mm-hmm. which is which is wonderful. I actually really like that because it gives you enough people to actually like connect with, and therefore if you have a best girl or best, well, I guess best boy there's not i'm assuming there's more boys that are on uh, but like when you have like a, a favorite character and they're all different it makes sense it, it's it, it like this gives you the opportunity to fully explore each character's backstory and their purpose within the monogatari series so i like the doll ononoki a hell of a lot the 
Yuzuru, the, the 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 sister, the older sister, so to speak, I don't really care for her that much. Is it because you like the coup? I do like the coup, but she's yeah. also a very good character too because her uh, interactions with Araragi is pretty good later on. Kaiki is known as the best girl uh, by a lot of uh, people, ironically, but also genuinely. I found out why as well. I think that Kaiki is a better character than Araragi, period. In terms of, if you look at the span of the Monogatari series, I think Kaiki is awesome. Right. But at the same time, though, like, contextually with Baki Monogatari, Kizu Monogatari, Nisi Monogatari. Dude is a that, scum. That That's hard to say right yeah, now. Dude, like, you have to vouch for Aragi because of how much screen time he has. But once you consume everything else, I'll probably have a better idea of how to judge his character. Yeah, like, Kaiki right now is just some scum that is very like, oh, you're just justifying your actions. He to... did the sisters dirty, man. Yeah, super dirty in terms of tricking them. So there is no redeeming factor from Kaiki right now. And I get that because I had that same opinion as well. But at the same time, it's also like the way that it's written is like, especially with all of the Monogatari series so far, it's really hard to pick out like an absolute protagonist of an absolute antagonist. It's like the, the, the character like, roles within Nishio's work is very very well done because a lot of times it's like you would think that okay Shinobu is absolutely the villain of Kizumonogatari but like is she really is there like another power behind that like she actually has no control whatsoever and it turns out she's just doing her part because that's what her existence stands for and is Araragi really like the pure antagonist protagonist but he himself is also like taking on the power that came from this aforementioned quote unquote antagonist. It's it's I, I like that there's like a blend of what characters are supposed to do, what they're supposed to represent. It's not as clear cut as 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 Jojo, for example. Like Jojo, you know exactly who the hero is. To a comical exactly. degree too. It's yeah. like they it's, make it so clear. Especially this is like if you couldn't see it, you will definitely hear it based on the music as okay. well. So I, I I mean, we're going back to talking about JoJo. I'll just say real quick, in the first episode of Battle Tennessee, so I think that's episode 10, it involves uh, two uh, police officers with uh, antagonizing one of the supporting characters of Battle Tennessee. Smokey Brown, right? Yes. Smokey Jackson, Smokey Brown, I need to remember. And then the, the two uh, police officers are just the most comical, cheesy, generic. They even call them, they even call it, oh, you call us pigs? And then they like, wipe their boogers on them and it is just like guys like i get it you're bad like chill like stop we we, we get the point like it, it, it in, in, in many ways like the monogatari series is like the perfect foil exactly for jojo because it, first of all male characters in jojo female characters in monogatari very very long backstories and expositions within the Monogatari series based on storytelling and Jojo is a lot of fist work and, and action and like explaining of the powers and the reasons why one is hero, one is evil. Uh, and then of course you then have like, like it's, it's not that it's muted colors, but it's like a very smooth color palette with Monogatari. Like I like the juxtaposition they have from flickering lights and opposite colors. Whereas Jojo is just like pure vibrancy. Oh, uh, my shadows in Jojo, we're just going to color it purple. Uh, yeah. but, but but shadows are universally no, drawn as black. No no. no, 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 no. Guys, guys. He will look under the light as green hair, but really he's yellow hair. But no, but that doesn't make any sense, uh, uh, David Production, but fuck it. Like, you, you, you have to admit that, like, with regards to Nishio and Shaft and with Araki, Araki and David Productions, like, they are, like, perfect matches for what they're trying to represent like you cannot i mean it's not that they, they've been doing consistently like jojo for like david productions monogatari for shaft like you could not have asked a better studio for each property to be done all right uh before i get into housekeeping and end the episode will now that you have consumed everything uh up till now which is bake kize nise uh what do you think the next leg of your journey is going to look like? I'm half expecting there to be more 
characters i think that like this is like a slow progression into like the monogatari series where like you get to see more beyond the main five girls and aragi and meme and shinobu from uh part one uh later on i think it's is it neko black right comes so neko unfortunately the way that monogatari is structured is that there are three parts to the whole main storyline and uh will has consumed Almost everything in part one except for Neko Black, which consists of uh, four episodes, I think. And then uh, afterwards, that's when the second season of Monogatari officially starts, right? But then there's also like Neko a, White. A, a little like jumbling of which parts to watch first and all that. Yes, uh, because the second season is you have to stop in between for Hana got Monogatari. So the even though Will and I wanted to consume all of part one and cap this off, unfortunately, the consumption is too skewed such that we decided to bridge the two Nekos together so then it ties in better as part one to part two. Of- and in a similar way as well with Jason going into part three, which is Stardust Crusader for uh, JoJo, there's four curves. It's 48 episodes, so it's too much to ask for him to watch all of that prior to doing the Gotta Watch a Ball third episode. And not just that, but to really talk about 48 episodes, it's it, it, it's it, doing it, everyone it, a it disservice. Would, it would be a four-hour episode. We don't want to do that. So what we're going to do with me for uh, season... Uh, no, part three, season two of... So weird. So weird. Uh, we're just going to call it Stardust Crusaders, right? Yeah. Okay. For Stardust Crusaders, 48 episodes. We will split it into probably two two three parts yeah i think i have an idea of how to split it up um probably two parts and then i'll also watch like an equal amount of the rest of season one and then second season of uh um i'll leave it to you to sort of let me know like which parts i should consume prior to kind of watch them all three but fear not because we will let you know in the episode title for gotta watch them all what we will consume the last thing that we would mention is we will we decided as uh, co-hosts to do two Gotta Watch Them All uh, episodes per podcast season such that uh, we would consume everything uh, at a faster pace instead of, for example, doing – because it would take like like years and years and years. Yeah, this actually would be a good opportunity to ask you know, the listeners, people who follow us on our websites, our Facebooks, uh, our Twitters, or even you know just if you have our emails, they just let us know – like. If there is a long-standing series that exists beyond two or three seasons, multiple curves that you think we can cover, throw out some suggestions. I'm sure Jason and I both have ideas of what to consume, but it wouldn't hurt to see like a wider list of what everyone else wants to listen to. And because we are now kind of double our speed of consumption, so then we have two of these per podcast. I thought for a minute you were doing that as a slate on me where like I speed up the amount of time I watch my anime. Well, well you're being too paranoid, bro. Yeah, but again, I'm, it's not everything because unfortunately Crunchyroll does not allow for me to speed up anime. It's, Only Netflix does. It's almost like uh, Crunchyroll is telling you don't do that, bro. Uh, I guess. Hey, man, one, 1. 1.25 speed is not that bad. Two times speed, I get that is chaotic evil. All right. That is the end of episode 29 of the Good Anime Ooh, Pal that was, podcast. That was a doozy. You can always reach us through our email, gapalette at gmail.com. That's G-A-P-A-L-E-T-T-E at gmail.com, all lowercase, all one word. You can also contact us on Twitter using the panel, uh, using the handle at Palette Good. That's capital P and capital G, all one word. We have a Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash Palette Good, capital P, capital G, all one word. We have a website. And uh, it's great, really. You should check it out. I put a lot of time and effort into it. You really did, yeah. www.goodanimepalette.com, all lowercase, all one word. You can join us on Discord, and you can also uh, join us on our Mal Club. We would like to have uh, hear our feedback from you guys, positive and negative, and just like chat and hang out and just get to know one another. Music credits for this episode. Our intro music is No Cry by Fashion. Our brick music is Be Right There by Omie. And our outro music is Future Vise by Kyo. Our music was provided courtesy of EpidemicSound.com. If you are interested in using Epidemic Sound as a service, we'll have a referral link for you that is provided in the show description. Will, how does it, how does it feel, man? I think that like it, it's good that we're able to finish all this, but I 
do need to take a little bit of a break from anime considering i think you you might even want to take a bit of a break from manga considering that like i probably watched just as much amount of anime as you have read the amount of manga i've read so much manga but hey will you have something in your possession now that you can marvel and look at yeah this is going to be digging up the bulk of my time now rather than watching anime i'm going to be uh looking into uh artwork and uh, a little bit of history into the jojo verse um i I think this is like edging on to close the completion is part i haven't i haven't finished uh, reading most of the manga yet. Um, I'm still waiting for most of the things to get published in English. Um, but at the same time, like I'm just happy that the new seasons are getting updated. I'm super stoked to watch the Stone Ocean Part 2. So let's just bring it all, man. I just want more JoJo. Uh, and I'm sure for you as well, it's like now that you've done, like re- you've, you've gone through all of uh, Monogatari, um, you're now just waiting for the other seasons, the other arcs to be done as well right? I'm, I'm telling you they better fucking do it shaft better fucking get on there they, 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 please they're still an active studio so they definitely have something going on in the works it's just a matter of uh when nishio wants to get these things done and adapted as well uh, studio shaft i know madoka magica is earning you a lot of money and it does look really nice i don't care about it though so please just give me monogatari but if you cannot which why wouldn't you uh, I will settle for March Comes in Like a Lion Season 3, please. Okay. Oh, yeah. Fuck, I need to finish that, too. Oh, God damn. So much to watch. Okay. Well, nonetheless, thank you very much for joining in to today's uh, episode of the Gotta Watch em All series. This is episode 29. Uh, look forward to the next episode. Uh, and then, of course, when episode 3 of the good, uh, not the good, the Gotta Watch em All series comes out, be prepared. I am super stoked to talk about more JoJo, and Jason's super stoked to talk about more Monogatari. So until then, we'll catch you later. Later.